What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of I'll Call You Right Back podcast with me, your host. My name is Chad Medved. I'm the captain of this ship, all hands on deck. Uh, you know, welcome aboard, if you will. Uh, first thing is first, you know, big week for the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, two huge brands in the city of Pittsburgh. We got Turner Dairy Farms, who are obviously my people. You know, I rep Turner Dairy uh, till, you know, till I'm in the dirt. Uh, and then we got Eaton Park, which is also an iconic brand of the city of Pittsburgh. You know, you think of ketchup, you think of Permani Brothers, you think of the Smiley Cookie, and you think of the Turner Terry, or the Turner's Tea Carton. You know, that's the Mount Rushmore of Pittsburgh, you know, plain and simple. But they teamed up to bring us a limited edition flavored Smiley Cookie Milk. Uh, you heard it right here. Smiley Cookie Milk is now available at all Eaton Park, Giant Eagle, and Get Go locations. To be 100% transparent, I just thought of this while I was saying it, I'm not sure if it's all of them, but I'm sure it's most of them. So you got a little hankering for a little smiley cookie milk, get on in your car, put on some good music, drive on down to your get-go, your gas station, or not gas station, but get-go, Giant Eagle, uh, you know, Eaton Park, if you will, and grab yourself an ice cold pint of that smiley cookie milk while you still can. But anyway, the reason that everyone is here this week we got a big episode this week. You know, I usually don't talk to two guests, but we got a two guest episode this week. Uh, this week I sit down with Bill Waves and Big Germ, who are two people that has, you know, their names have resonated through the Pittsburgh hip hop scene. Uh, Big Germ obviously has a well-established resume, Grammy nominated, multi-platinum producer, engineer. He's worked with everyone from Wiz to Mac to Juicy J to Snoop Dogg to Rick Ross. You know, he got a, he got a big, he got a big resume and uh, he has definitely established himself in the game. And then Bill Waves is a local artist from Pittsburgh who, uh, you know, if you're familiar with anything about Pittsburgh hip hop, I'm sure that the name Bill Waves has came into your, uh, came across your path. Um, he was real good friends with Mac Miller. Uh, a lot of the old iconic Mac Miller videos that you would watch on like YouTube and shit like that. Um, you know, Bill was in them. You know what I mean? Like he was, he was there for a lot of it whenever Mac was coming up. And, uh, this week, Bill and, uh, Bill and Germ sit down with me and we talk all about their debut album, debut album big waves, uh, put the names together, big germ, bill waves, big waves. Uh, I got a little sneak preview of the 13 track album. I got to listen to it all. And, uh, I'm telling you it's good. It's good stuff. You know, it's heavy. It's heavy. Uh, bill writes differently. You know, bill, bill's lyrics are pulled from his life and his experiences in life. Uh, throughout this episode, we talk about his struggles with drugs, uh, and you know his struggles with life. Honestly, you know it sounded like he got a he had a really rough life coming up. You know, started drugs uh, young and kind of was just in and out uh, throughout up until you know about five years ago. Five years ago, he got clean from pills, and uh, you know he seems to just have a completely different mindset from the person he was so long ago. And uh, Bill and Germ knew each other, obviously, you know, years and years ago. But uh, now they came together again to collaborate on this uh, debut album, Big Waves, which is dropping everywhere Saturday, July 17th. You can get on Apple Music. You can get it on Spotify. You can get it anywhere you get music. But uh, hop on over to Big Germ 412 on Instagram or at Bill Waves and follow both of them and uh, keep tabs on what's going on with those guys. They got videos dropping here soon. They're starting to YouTube channel, but uh, I just really appreciate uh, sitting down with Bill and Germ. I mean, it, it, it's I'm a, I'm appreciative whenever people can come in here and be vulnerable in this podcast because you know that's what I want. I want transparency. I want like the raw stories. I want I want to hear about their life completely. I don't want anything sugar coated. And we didn't do none of that this episode. We had fun for sure, but you know the first the first half of this episode is basically me learning about Bill's life, which is like I said, it had, he had a troubled past, and uh, you know Germ chimes in here and there about you know what he's been up to since uh, him and I have talked three years ago, and uh, you know it, it's heavy stuff. You know what I mean? Like if you listen to Big Waves, the lyrics are pulled from Bill's life. And uh, if you listen to them lyrics, you'll understand a little bit more. But uh, Germ produced, mixed, did all the beats for this. I don't know the technological terms of it, but he did all of that 
of this album. And uh, Bill obviously uh, wrote all the lyrics, but um, I urge you to check out their work. You know what I mean? These two dudes poured their uh, poured their time and uh, passion and love into this album, and uh, it's pretty dope. I listened to it probably three times, I think. I wanted to listen to it before me and Bill sat down, just so I could get a feel of uh, you know what he was kind of what, what, what he was saying in that. But uh, I appreciate everyone listening. You know, I really do. And uh, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Like I said, it gets a little bit deep. I forgot Big Germ got shot, you know, three years ago before he moved to Atlanta. He fucking got shot in a park. You know, I interviewed him recently after that happened, you know, all that time ago, and I just completely forgot about it. So we talk about that in the end. Uh, Bill's, like I said, Bill's talking about his struggles with addiction and how he kind of pulled himself out of that. And then uh, we start to uh, lighten things up with a lot of uh, good listener questions that revolve around skateboarding, you know, all kinds of good shit. And then uh, we finish off with Desert Island questions. But without further ado, episode 171 of I'll Call You Right Back podcast with Bill Waves and Big Germ. I gotta use the telephone. Hello? I'll call you right back podcast. All right. So I usually uh, try to think about how I came across people whenever, uh, whenever I have them on here. Obviously I know who you are. We talked before a long, long time ago. I can't remember what number you were. I want to say it was three years ago though. Yeah, it was definitely like one of, uh, one of the first ones. Uh, one of the first, like, uh, you were probably the you were probably the most nervous I was in the beginning talking to you, <laughs> just because like don't be nervous with me, man. I'm not nervous now, but uh, I was. Uh, I'm definitely nervous to talk to you. I mean, like I don't know anything about you really. I'm excited that you uh, wanted to come on here. Like you said before, you don't really do too many uh, interviews, so like I really don't know shit about you. Yeah, you know, like I know that you're from the city. I know that like your name has traveled across it uh, quite a bit, and then uh, you know I see that you're starting to come out with like a bunch of music again. Yeah. You, now, you did the track with BD and uh, Billy Hoyle. What, now, were you doing, like, did you have other stuff right before then? Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I put out, like, I put out a tape last summer um, on that piff. It's called The Yellow Ghost. Yellow Ghost. Um, and then I put out, like, another uh, compilation. I honestly have, I have to, like, go and look at what it's called. Uh, Wings, or... Uh, it's like me. I know you probably put out so much shit you just don't even remember it. Well, it well, basically, I, I send shit to people and then they put it out. So I, by the time it's out, I like don't even yeah. remember it. Yeah, and it's probably like packaged completely differently. Wings of birds. So I put out. So last, uh, so I put out a, a EP in 2018 called For the Lost Children. That's okay. Yeah, that's the last one that I saw on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that uh, that was my last project. And then Germ, as I was basically Germ was moving. Uh, um, and I, um, I basically had just like finished like going through the system and like I was in a couple, uh, three quarter houses. I was on like some pretty serious, like state probation and I've, I had just gotten done with that. And that's when I started like writing seriously again. Yeah. And then, um, so I basically was just like trying to develop myself and just like not stop this time. Yeah. Um, you know, the first time that I really started going hard with music was like back in 2000. 13 um i started writing and uh i put out a mixtape uh mac helped me do it mac produced a couple of things on it um and then uh basically i was also like getting into other stuff too i started doing pills and stuff like that yeah and so i, cu- I couldn't stay focused like I, I just couldn't and i was just like running around doing crazy stuff so long story short <laughs> i had a bunch of consequences at that lifestyle and i ended up back here sorry if i'm like going all over the place no this but, is uh, a, this is a tangential podcast this is what it's for <laughs> yeah definitely but um i appreciate you but yeah then uh so i basically like had just gotten out of this like three-quarter house um that i was like uh my probation had me um st- staying in um because i had violated my probation and then um 
what's it called? Uh, I was just trying to like, like I said, I was trying to finally stick to it. Yeah. Like I, I couldn't stay focused before and uh, I would basically like, I basically started writing and you know, I would start things and then stop and start things and then stop. I found a daily bread um, in uh, 2009. Yeah. Um, Let and, me put a pin on this real quick. Okay. You know, I, I feel like, I feel like I got you with the ball. I, I got the ball rolling with you, but like, I want to try to figure out you know, a lot of the stuff from the past. So like one of the things was daily bread. I, I, that's how I feel like I first knew about you was like, you were involved with daily bread. I don't really know how you were involved with it. I didn't know that you were like the founder of it. Like when, when did that happen? Uh, so basically, um, it was like in the beginning kind of, you know, mom, I was, I basically, I just posted a, a picture of it, but it was me and Mac rapping in my mom's attic in point breeze. Yeah. And that was like, uh, kind of the hangout spot on Point Breeze. And that ended up, um, there just ended up being like several creatives that would end up going through, coming through there and hanging out, like buying some weed, smoking some weed. And Mac ended up being one of them. Um, Lucas Stevens was one of them. He's a, a you know, photographer. Um, he started, you know, he was a photographer from Pittsburgh, just all kind of stuff. And uh, basically I just kind of started picking stuff up. Like, so... <laughs> It goes back so far, man. How old are you, first of all? I'm 33. And where you and you grew up in Point Breeze? Uh, I no, I I moved to Pittsburgh in 2002. Oh, okay. And uh, me and my family, like my dad, got a really good job here, um, and me and my family moved here in 2002, and uh, we lived in Squirrel Hill for a couple years, and then um, I started getting pretty bad uh, with like pills, started getting in trouble, and my family split up, and me and my mom moved to Point Breeze, and my uh. And my family like split up. And so it was just me and my mom at Point Breeze in this apartment. And uh, then Beatty, uh, I went to high school with him. He was my best friend back then. Oh, okay. He was one of my best friends. And Malcolm was Beatty's uh, little brother's friend. Yeah. So that was the dynamic when we were, when I was 15. Is Beatty was my best friend. He had a little brother named Derek and Malcolm, Mac was his best friend. Yeah. And so that's how I met them. And so, okay. Be, and so one day... BD shows up at my house and he uh, has some tr trouble at home and he needed a place to stay. Yeah. And, my, and my mom gave him my room because we had an extra room. And uh, I just come in one day and I see BD writing uh, in his room, sitting down. I'm like, we always used to listen to Big E and like all different kind of, you know, music. And I saw BD writing one day. And then uh, <laughs> long story short, that was the first time I ever saw him making music. And then, um, you know, I eventually... Uh, like about a year later, uh, me and BD like got in some fight because we were kids and we got in some fight. And then like a year later, me and my mom moved to another apartment up the street and uh, I come down to my mailbox and there's a mixtape in it. And it's the first ill-spoken mixtape that was ever made. Oh, uh, that's dope. And uh, basically it was like me and BD had like got in some stupid fight as kids. And then he like, we weren't talking for a while. And then he like came back and dropped it in my mailbox because he was, you know, it was just like, yo, we're, we're making this music now. Like, and I was like, yo, that's so cool. And uh, so I immediately hit him up and like, we, you know, reconciled and I was like, yo, I want to chill. And then like, I started, that's when I started writing. How old were you then? <laughs> it's like 18 or 19. Oh, okay. And then uh, Malcolm was like 17. And then, so basically I was just like, uh, you know, then we formed like the East End Empire um, where it was like Mayo, B. White, um, everybody, you know, that was in the 58s, Ghosty, um, Vils, um, you know, and uh, BD, um, Fran, and Vinny from the Come Up. Yeah. Um, and Will Cowson, Willie Whips, uh, you know, he's the one who kind of like, like ma made up the name East End Empire. And it was kind of like a thing. Like we were all like, kind of like, yeah, we're the East End Empire. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I'm trying to keep it rolling here, but. You don't have to keep it rolling. I feel like, I feel like uh, you don't have to feel like that you have to like keep something rolling. Like it's very long. We'll be here for a yeah. little bit. But uh now I'm, I'm curious. So before you get into like, you know, writing and shit like that, like, did you have any idea of what you wanted to do before this? Like, I mean, nah. from whenever I listen to the tape, like you, you sent me big waves. I listened to it. I've listened to some of your old music in the past and I feel like, you know, it's heavy, you know, you write heavy music, you know, there's a lot of your life. I mean, it's, it's all of your life and you know, you're writing about like drug use, like all kinds of other shit like that. So it sounds like you definitely been through shit and it sounds like that you had a pretty wild ride coming up. Uh, and like I said, you're 
like your name is something that I've heard just because of like ties to Mac, BD, all that. So it's like always something that I, I've like been aware of, but I never really knew like, you know, how it kind of started to come up there. I never knew like where you were from and like what kind of shit you were into. I just knew that somehow you were tied to, to Mac and all the rest of the dudes. Cause like I was like friends with the 58 dudes. So like I, a lot of it crosses over and uh, I just, you know, I was trying to like figure out kind of how you got, thrown into it so that's that's pretty much how you just got into music is just like you, you had just other friends and you just kind of jumped into it with them after that i never in my life would ever even dream of like thinking i could make music or yeah, that, like, like that's just how i was like i kind of grew up in this like real humble or this real kind of just like you know humble like christian family and like it was kind of like seen in like um and like kind of like my family is like you know if you're like famous you're like a big shot yeah or something like that and so like you like know, a negative connotation uh not even like not even like negative just kind of like that's not what we are like uh, okay. so i just like never ever imagine myself doing any kind of like sh- yeah you know um so uh you know bd and, and mac were like the first people to like you know try to do that and yeah. like i like didn't even picture myself doing that but then when i saw them do it i tried you yeah know yeah, I mean? yeah i was like you know i was never really like a person to like you know try something like that like i always like had to like see someone do it and i'll be like all right i'll try you yeah know? for sure it's That's more approachable I, yeah, yeah it's yeah. definitely more approachable it's more welcoming because it's not as like crazy it's like no one you know is doing it so it's like that's like i mean it's intimidating at first for sure and really that was that's just like a testament to like my self-esteem at the time like i just didn't Ever, and like honestly like that's how I was like growing up like I never did play, played sports like I was always kind of like an introverted kid and mm. my mom my mom would kind of like baby me so she would be like like she wouldn't like push me to win and so like I would kind of shoot like she would be like oh it's okay like you don't have to win or anything like you know and in a way that was good but like you know in certain ways like you know I kind of it kind of like just picture myself like never doing anything great at all yeah I kind of like never picture myself doing anything um crazy like that and so you know I had to I had to see you know I'm just saying it's like a testament to my self-esteem like I had to see my friends do it I didn't no I get what you're saying I wasn't that confident of a person to do that yeah you didn't have that like hunger inside you to like like run after that now what uh like like what kind of hobbies and shit did you have back then like what were you into you said you didn't play sports I feel like everyone you know every young kid is playing sports and shit so like what kind of other shit were you doing I mean, my hobbies was like drugs. Like, yeah, from early on, you got into it. It's kind of like tired by now. Like, I know Germs heard this over and over, you know. I get it. But it's just like, it's just my story. And like, you know, uh, uh, and like, unfortunately, that's just the way it went. Like, I was a well off kid. Yeah. um, You know, but like, I started skating and like, you know, um, and I started really being heavily influenced by hip hop, like when I was like 10 or 11. How'd you get into music? Um, I just, I lived in uh, Shaker Heights, Ohio at one point, and like my, there was no music, um, like in my household. Like there was like one Led Zeppelin tape. Besides that, oh, there, was, wow. there was no music in my household, and that was from like when my dad like surfed, like you know, back in the day, way back when, and he <laughs> he hadn't picked up. Like my dad was like studying to like be a preacher, mm. and my mom had a brain aneurysm when I was in her stomach, and so she never worked like my entire life. Yeah, and uh, so my dad was going to be a teacher, and then I think he or he was going to be a like uh, he was studying theology, and then he ended up being a teacher, and then he ended up working in private school. Schools. Yeah, and so we would move all over the country, and so whenever he moved, whenever we moved here, he got a job at Winchester Thurston. It's like one of the best. It's like the best private school in the city. Yeah, and that's where I met, you know, like Max older brother. Oh, uh, okay. And that's where that's how like I had my first sleepover at like his house. Like uh, and that was the first time I ever met Mac when he's eleven years old, having a sleepover at his house. Like we were well off kids from like a nice neighborhood. Yeah, like, you know what I mean. But like Pittsburgh's like an interesting dynamic. You know what I mean. Uh, you know, you got like Homewood two blocks away. It's all kind of like packed in. Like we were from the city, you know what I mean? So yeah. this is all like the hip hop we make and like the music we make and the stories we tell us all a testament to like, you know, growing up in the city and like the dynamic of it and like, you how know, the different areas bleed into each other. Exactly. And how like, you know, <sighs> yeah, like, and we wanted to be, you know, a part of the culture as a whole yeah, and not just a part of like, you know, you know, um, one side of it. 
you know. Yeah, that's understandable. I feel like that you're definitely, you know, you you both are obviously intergrained in the in Pittsburgh's hip hop. Like you being like a producer, I mean, you're obviously the best. I mean, you're the most well known producer to come out of Pittsburgh. You know, you we've talked three years ago about your introduction to music. It's like, how, how did you get into it again? Like, what, how did you even start jumping into it? Like making it? Yeah. Um, it was very random. Like, come up on that mic. Sorry. <laughs> get up here. Um, yeah, like my sister's boyfriend gave me, like he kind of showed me Fruity Loops and then this other program, okay. uh, uh, SoundForge. So I use SoundForge to chop samples and then FL Studio to to make beats. And it was like, kind of like what Bill said. I I never felt like, that was never like a career path. It was just like, I became obsessed with it. And yeah. then I would just make beats every day. It was that and like skateboarding at that point. It's strange because like a lot of people that like get involved in whatever they're, you know, kind of in love with is not something that they like think about whenever they're real young. Like they don't think that, you know, I never thought I was going to be doing a fucking podcast. We didn't even know what this was back then. So it's interesting to see how people like kind of get the seed started inside of them and like how it grows from there. And it's weird because skateboarding usually is an underlying theme with, I mean, everything from, you know, I talked to some jujitsu black belt a couple weeks ago. He fucking was a skateboarder. Like mm-hmm. he, you know, skateboarding, hip hop, everything. It's like, it's weird that that was, that that's always like one of the, one of the big things, even in music, like you watch any skate videos, you could hear anything from fucking mamas and the papas to like, you know, Gucci man in there. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty interesting. You were always into skateboarding, Bill? Uh, I started skateboarding when I was like like nine or ten, like yeah. probably like ninety, like ninety nine, like, and I skated for like a few years, and uh, and like like I said, we then uh, we like moved to Pittsburgh, and it was just like, uh, you know, um, like I don't know, my family was just kind of like we were just kind of like uh, at a disconnect with each other, and like I was pissed we moved, and and like you know I just started, and I remember skating like when I was twelve years old, like the first time being in skate parks and seeing like these two kids like fighting over um, this, like these pills. And I was like, what is that? And they're like, it's Adderall. And I was like, oh shit, I have some of that at home. Yeah. You know? And they're like, oh, you can sell that. Oh word. Mm. And like, I was like 12 years old and that's when it was like planted in my head. And then, you know, it became like Clonopin too. And like, you know, um, you know, I was prescribed that too. And I'm not saying that was like responsible for my addiction, but I just think it's interesting how like, you know, it tied into it. And like, uh, you know, but then that was early on. So that set the tone. And so I moved to Pittsburgh and like, I put down the skateboard and I put down, uh, any, my confidence just kind of went down. I put down an aspect of like being creative and like, um, and just started doing drugs. Yeah. And that became my life, you know, up until as a, uh, up until you said, I think I heard on your tape five years. Yeah. Well, well, I got clean the last time I did like, um, pills and stuff like that. Um, I got clean like for like three years, um, back in like the summer of 2016. I smoke now. Yeah. Um, but like, uh, but that was the last time I, I did any hard drugs or anything. Yeah, it was like five years ago. Congratulations. Thank you, man. There's a lot of people that, uh, you know, people, you see a lot of people fall from it. You see a lot of people like, you know, thrive it. I have family members that are like kind of coming out of it now. And it's like, it's, it's good to see people that have like kind of been in the deepest parts come out. You yeah. Know, it's kind of like, uh, I was definitely motivating a little definitely bit. Not easy to do. I don't know if I've ever heard a track from you that like, wasn't like, kind of like, you know, I, I don't want to call them like emotional. I mean, there's emotion in it, but it's like, you know, everything is just feels heavy. You know, it feels like you, you it feels like, you know, a journal entry that you wrote. It's like heavy shit from you. Now, when did the idea of you two, you know, collaborating on an album come, come into play? Um, I know you, when's the first time you guys work together? Like 10 years ago, actually. Yeah. I mean, it, Mac brought him around and then um, he did a track with Mayo. Like, that was, rest in peace, Mayo. Yeah. Yeah. Rest in peace, Mayo. That shit's crazy. Um, I think that was the first time I met you when you did that with him. Really? Maybe be, maybe a little before that. That was probably like 2011. Yeah. Or maybe yeah, I probably, I, th- I feel like I met you before that, but maybe you didn't realize because it was just like, there was a lot going on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> a lot of, a lot of it. Like he could have easily just like not even like really noticed me until like I did that song or, or I don't know, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, like Wiz was always down there. That's what Germ was doing back then. I remember going down the studio, like, uh, Mac or somebody would bring me down there and Germ would be down there and Wiz would be down there. And I'd be scared as hell to go down there. I'd be like so intimidated, you know, for sure. I remember like the first time Germ recorded me, I was like shaking, like in the booth, like, you know, and, I was, you know, it's like smoke of weeds. I was like all nervous too, but like, you know, and like you hear, you know, and man, I heard some, some hits of whiz. 
I mean, it's just like a, you Being know, recorded it's, in the back. It's like a legendary place. Like anyone, it don't matter if you're into hip hop or music in general. It's like you hear about that place and it's like, you know, that like some powerful shit happened there. I was overwhelmed whenever I went in there to talk to you. Like even whenever I was in there talking to like other people, it's just like you feel, uh, I don't know. It's just like powerful shit happened in them rooms. And it's like, you almost feel like you're not like, are you talking about over in Edna? Yeah, well, that's what I was talking about. I'm yeah. sure that you guys. I'm, this was just across the bridge, like, yeah. um, just before that, and like, uh, you know, it's the same vibe, and it's kind, and it's, For sure. and, and you know, it has the same energy. It's East Studio, and it's I do labs, and that's where Germ, you know. That's, it's just like you, it, like for me personally, like it felt like you know, you know, am I deserving to be in here? You know, there's a lot of people that are in there. It's like, should I even be in this place? I mean, but, I felt like that the first time I went to. I mean. Wiz was one of the first people I recorded. Yeah. He was already, well, the first people I recorded there, but he was already signed to like Warner Brothers. Like he was only signed to them for like a year or two, but. When was that? Um, 2008 is when I, yeah, he was signed to them maybe like 07 and 08 or something. Oh, that makes sense. Cause didn't like Rolling Papers come out in like 2009? Rolling I Papers think. one was like 11. Oh, really? Because Cushion Orange Juice came out in 2010. Uh, okay. Crazy. I can never even remember all the it's dates. It's all a blur. It is. It's all a blur. Uh, now, for you to like, you know, like obviously you're getting into music and you're like writing and shit like that. And you said you were writing seriously. Like when is your first project or when is your like first song that you put out into the world? Um, so I can, I think I can break this one down pretty quickly, but it's like, all right, so I started writing with, with Mac and Beatty. And yeah. so we did this song called Bring It On. Yeah. And it's on the first ill-spoken mix, or the second ill-spoken mixtape, which is, I think it's self-titled. It's, it's the ill-spoken, if I'm not, or is it called um, How High? Mm -hmm. Nerr, is it? One of them was. Yeah, 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 I think, I don't know. And, it, and um, it's called Bring It On. And that was like the first time I was ever in the studio Um or that was like one of the first times I was ever in the studio. It was like one of the first verses I ever wrote. And like, uh, it was just real, like my first two bars were like real, real dope. And like, I remember like, I loved it. And, uh, they, and like Mac and BD loved it. And it was, it was awesome. And, and I was just like, you know, I was like real excited, but like I said, like my lifestyle at that point, I just couldn't really stick to anything. I was, yeah. everything was about the drugs to me. Everything was about selling drugs to me. That was what facilitated my ego at the time. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, um, anything else that didn't facilitate my ego at the time, I would just put down, you know, and like, uh, I know that sounds a little deep, but, and, but, you know, and so, but I, I would, I kept writing regardless. So I, I, it was just something I like kind of kept doing like passively and like, I would write, I would really make an effort to like, um, you know, be like a rapper from New York or something like that. Like all the, like, you know, that's what I would emulate. Like I would listen or and listen to Cassidy or like, you know, I basically just try and copy them Yeah, yeah, yeah. and try and, you know, you know, like if you watch like the first, um, there's like a freestyle of me and Mac in my attic and it's like a, a well-known like old video of Mac and it's like, you know, I'm basically just trying to like copy, ca like flow like Cassidy and like um, Mac would always make fun of me. He would always be like, you know, Bill's like, you know, delusional. Like he thinks he's like a rapper from Harlem or something like, <laughs> and like, you know, I was, and like, first of all, I was a little bit delusional. Like, you know. Um, well, I mean, was it overwhelming? I don't mean to interrupt you, but like yeah. I, I interrupt people a lot. Like, I mean, is it overwhelming to you know, be around two people that are obviously like good wordsmiths. Like, you, you, you know, I mean, with Mac and Beatty. Yeah. I feel I like mean, it's, at, that, at that point, like I didn't see like, they had just like started, they had just made an album and yeah, like, I guess that's a good point, you know? And like, you know, so I, like to me, I saw it like, Oh, if they can do it, I can definitely do it. Like, yeah. I remember like I used to pick on Mac, like, you know, he was my friend's little brother. Yeah. 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 For sure. So I'd see him post about big L on Facebook. I'd be like, you little bitch. You don't know anything about big L. Shut <laughs> up. Like, you know, and like that was the dynamic. So like, I was kind of like seen as like, that older kid that was like tough on him I was part of the pressure that like you know what I mean like all of us were like there was a group of us that were like hard on Mac about that stuff and that was part of the pressure that made him as you know yeah that's everyone everyone that got an older friend like you exactly know, they, they they cultivate something and, and different. I was gonna say it came because I had somebody that was hard on me for sure everyone you know? I mean I'm just like you I'm sure you had older people that were like kind of you know I'm I, I, like you're kind of, you're the low man on the totem pole. You mm -hmm. got to fucking earn your stripes and you got to just like, you know, just grind it out. You know, that's part of the fun about being, you know, in a group of people. It's like, if you're someone that could like, you know, dish it out and like get it back. It's like, once people aren't like fucking with you and you're the only one that people aren't fucking with, that's because you're not as, 
you're not as close inside with everyone. Yeah. You know, people might like, just not feel, you don't feel like it's like acceptable almost. It's but, good to have people be hard on you. Yeah, but I mean, you don't really grow without that. For sure. I, I mean, like you can't be like coddled and shit like that. But it, yeah. so for you guys to all just like be running around doing all this, it's, I mean, like, how do you like, like you said a lot of your life is just drugs. Like what else besides that? Is there anything else besides, are you doing anything like, you know, constructive? I mean, nah, like I remember like I was like, I put down skateboarding too when I moved here too. Yeah. Like Aaron, like, uh, so you got into drugs when you were 13, 14, 12, 13 is when yeah. I started first, like taking pills and like, you know, abusing pills I was prescribed to, uh, you know, I remember being 12 years old and like, you know, being on Adderall all, up until five in the morning when I was 12. Yeah, and, like, for sure. Um, and just kind of like the influence, like I remember seeing like the Vicodin pill on the M&M CD and like, yeah. uh, like I was like, man, that's so cool. And like, I just didn't have anybody around me to like, be so like, like, that's not that cool. Like, yeah. don't fuck with that. And it's like, you know, he's just telling a story like, you know, you know, like you don't want to do that. Like, do you have any siblings? I have an older brother. Yeah. 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 Now, I mean, like, are you guys close? Uh, well, um, we're closest and we're like cool, but I don't really talk to him much. We whenever my family split, like he went with my dad and I okay. went with my mom. So you still, you, you didn't have like a, uh, like an older brother figure, like a- around all the time coming up. Cause like my brother's six years older than me. Like we weren't in the house the same time. Like he's obviously in, you know, in high school while I'm in elementary school, he's in college while I'm in high school. So he wasn't like there every single night, but he was still there to like shepherd me into like where I needed to go and like kind of put me onto all the cool shit and kind of like, you know, let me know what was all right and what wasn't. Yeah. You know, I mean like that, I feel like that that's super important. It's, I feel like I would be overwhelmed if I didn't have that sort of like guidance, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, my brother, I, I, me and him didn't have that dynamic. Like, I kind of just, like, looked um, up to stuff outside of my family. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, I don't know. Like, my family was just, like, real, like, you know, there was no music in the house or anything. It's not, like, it wasn't a strict household or anything. You know, my parents are very loving people. It's a great house to grow yeah. up in. But, like, it was just, there was no kind of anything in there, like, um like culture wise or like anyway so i just anyway all my influences and my older brother and things i looked up to were kind of outside of my family that makes sense yeah were you uh now in this time period or are you like hanging around in like the world of like time bomb and shit like that is that did that get introduced like back then um so yeah we, yeah because like, like i'm not really from like like i'm aware of it all i've been around it you know we started going down there and like 2009 or 2010 but like i know that it has like this whole story before then and like yeah it was on highland avenue yeah and and it was like a crazy shot it was like it looked a lot crazier back then too like yeah it was huge it had like what like the steel cut like uh writing in the beginning like letters sticking out yeah um and uh it was just a crazy location and like you know i think that location they probably the price got jacked up by now Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm you know, and you will walk in there and like, there's just so much history in there. Like you go in the back room and there's like pictures of Cameron and like Joel Santana, like sign, like that's how much history like was in time. bomb. like, can't, you know, people way before this, but just off the top of my head, I know like Cameron and Joel Santana will like come there to shop every yeah. time, you know? And like, definitely wild. When does, uh, like, when are you able to like kind of get your bearings where you, kind of recognize you got some shit wrong with the drugs where you can like trying to get out the first time or whatever. Well, that took a while. And I actually ended up making a lot of like, I made a, my first like tape before I got clean. Mm. Um, and uh, basically it was like, you know, so it was kind of on and off thing. And I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do creatively um, as my friends were kind of like ascending with their stuff. And as you know, Mac got bigger, um, you know, uh, that was big. Like it did something big to all of us. It gave all of us like the feeling like we can, we can really make something ourselves too. And so it was kind of like that moment where like Mac was like, yo, like, um, you, you should move out to Cali with me or something like that. And he was like blowing up. He had just put out kids. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Like, like it was a different dynamic. I kind of looked at him as like my little brother. And I was like, I just want to, I was like, you know, I want to do my own thing, man. Like, like I really feel like I kind of have the confidence now to do my own thing. And, and uh, so I stayed back and started Daily Bread. Mm-hmm. And th- and that started because like all, 
Cause you know, I would like, you know, sell weed. And so I had like, you know, so when we were 18, 19, like I had the best clothes out of anybody. Like, you know, it was probably nothing comparatively looking at it now, but when you're younger, that stuff's a big deal. Yeah, for sure. And so like, you know, Mac didn't have no clothes like at that point. And I remember when I didn't have any clothes and I started like, I saw like my boy Lucas wearing his first Supreme hat and I was like, yo, and I just started copying everything he did. Yeah. And, uh, and what's it called? And, uh, you know, that's how Mac was with me. And so actually all of, a lot of his early videos, he's wearing, he's like wearing clothes from my closet. Mm. And so I would dress him in all his clothes and like, I'd be like, oh, I'm a style you, I'm a style you, I'm gonna get you right. And yeah. like, you know, cause in the beginning he was wearing that crooked hat with the big <laughs> shirt, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I kind of took it upon myself to be like the stylist of the group. And that's how like the idea for Daily Bread got started. And so I made this like little blog and I would just like, just for fun, like, put little outfits together. So I would like go on the 10 deep website and like pull a pair of pants and like go on Supreme to pull a shirt and like put outfits together for, you know, and uh, just to kind of, as like a lo- my own little curation and I called it daily bread. Ah, uh, okay. And then I was like, when uh, was that? What year was that? So that's 2000, that's like 2008 and 2008. 2007, 2008. I'm in, I'm in like, I'm going to CCAC mm. and me and Mac are talking about moving to Philly together. And like, you know, we have no idea what we're doing at this point, but we're just like both trying to do something creatively, you know? Yeah. And, uh, then we all moved in a house together in South Oakland. He put out kids, he blew up long story short. And then I like stayed back and started daily bread. At this point I was an employee at time bomb. I was sweeping the floor. You can hear that in the, uh, the coldest winter and, um, second to last track on the album i say i'm sweeping the floor time bomb all my friends were out going on tour i'm back at home sniffing pills off the desk with 10 pounds in the drawer a dark cloud over my you know and uh that's like sets the tone for you know that that and so like uh basically um um I, i i'm writing on and off um and getting in trouble doing drugs for like the next strung out for the next like however many years then 2013 i finally like get serious about making a project of course, Mac is right there to help me. Yeah, He produces two songs right off the bat. He invites me out to his house. I go out there. He puts Absol on one of my tracks, like just, you know, at the drop of a, at the click of a finger. And yeah. like, and, uh, Putting on. <laughs> yeah, but I was, I was not focused still. I was like, basically just like wilding out, like doing pills and like, you know, uh, You're just not present in the moment with all that. Yeah. And so I, I put it down. And so I, I basically like put it down, got worse and worse and worse ended up uh like uh getting on some like serious state probation over like stupid duis and stuff like that yeah and then i ended up violating and going to jail um this is like 2015 (laughs) and then i'm like like basically i sold daily bread um and just left it because i had become more of a problem than i was helping anything there was by that time it was bigger than me by that time all there was a lot of artists in the community contributing to daily bread yeah um you know sean devine and bj the ones that own it now they open refresh next to it Uh, they own it now they they're yeah they're owners of it now yeah and so what's it called and so um it became bigger than me and i i became a problem and so i was like you know so i agree with my partner alex that he's the one i started daily bread with alex avakian and I agree with him to I would leave it and sign it away. That's, yeah. that's how bad things got, long story short. Yeah. And uh, so I was like, I'm going to start my life over. I don't have anything to lose. I'm just going to start making music. Like, screw it. And uh. Uh, it was really hard for me to do that. I wanted, you know, I went through a whole year where I was like, you know, my life's over. Like, everything's over. I went to jail. I went through, I was in and out of rehab three times. Um, and uh, I was like about to be at my end, you know. And yeah. uh then something happened and I just like my, I started working at this, uh, um, restaurant in Southside called Cucina Vitale. And, uh, I ended up in this dude, Matt Thornton's house and you interviewed him. Oh, wow. Yeah. Matt and, Thornton, huh? and he was, uh, he was, he was running a three quarter house at the time. And, uh, he got me a job at Cucina. He got me, introduced me to this dude, Frankie Vitale, who opened a restaurant called Cucina Vitale in Southside. And he, at one point, was a employee at the restaurant it used to be, and he was trying to kill himself, and he was on heroin, and he, long story short, ended up getting clean, and now he owns that restaurant. Wow. Not only that, but he bought the apartment above it and turned that into a second floor of his restaurant, too. So it's, like, flourishing. Yeah, he's killing it. Yeah, Cucina Vitale is a real, real, real cool spot. So he took me under his wing um, and helped me get clean. And uh, he started introducing me to books and stuff like that. 
uh, by like different authors, Napoleon Hill, stuff like that. And now you're, you're mental at this point in time. Like obviously you hear people can't quit unless they want to quit. Like, are you, you feel yourself at this point, like wanting to be done with it? Like, are you you're I will, exhausted I by it? I go back and forth. Yeah. So last year I struggled with, I would go back and forth. Like yeah. I didn't, I was trying to just build the confidence to finally stay clean. Yeah. For me, it was like, you know, sometimes I just didn't, I didn't even care anymore. Like I just, and for me, it was like a way of like, you know, like ending things for a day and like, you know, um, yeah, just numbing the shit. Yeah. And so like, you know, basically it took me a year of struggling and Frankie actually ended up firing me twice from his restaurant. And then he, I finally went to treatment one more time. And I finally picked up this book that he gave me. Um, and it was, it was just like a book. It was called power positive thinking. And it was just like, you know, these, all these different books I've basically read to help me change my life. You know, yeah. it's like, I just picked up some books. Like you hear that story all the time. Like it, I was, I was strung out, picked up some books. It's and such a wild dynamic because it's like, you hear people that are like, you know, down bad that will like do anything, like steal from family, you know, do anything to be able to like get that high. And it's like, then they're like, yeah, you know, I read a book and it's like, it's hard for, I'm, I'm sober. It's hard for me to fucking pick up a book and like want to apply some motivational shit to myself. Yeah. So I mean, it's always like pretty wild to hear that like someone in your position, you know, was able to do that and like find something from it. And even talking to Matt, like, you know, I never really had a conversation with like an addict who was at that point and, you know, came through and like was someone that would allow me to like, you know, ask questions that were, you know, not like, you know, like not, not, not sugarcoated questions. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's pretty interesting to hear. And it's pretty like, you know, I had people hit me up who, uh, had siblings that are struggling right now. And they're like, I sent them the episode. It's like, I, I don't know if that helps them or anything or not, but it's interesting to hear those aspects and like those points and how people like kind of when it like clicks for him yeah. now for you germ like when like obviously like he has you know a decade of of like just wild shit that we kind of just like went through now are you someone that like you know are you still aware of like what's going on with him as far as like a musician or you know you're just off i mean you're obviously building a fucking life that you're building yeah i mean i i recorded him a couple times and he actually lived i always break his balls for this but <laughs> He used to live in the basement of ID Labs, like the one in Etna now. Mm. At one point, yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, I had my room up there, and he would book sessions with me and miss the session from, you know, like, all he had to do was go up two flights of stairs. So, like... I'd be passed <laughs> out downstairs or something. And I didn't, know, I didn't know what was going on, really. Like, he, you know, you definitely didn't do that stuff in front of us. So, like, I didn't know how bad it was, I guess. Yeah. Um. Yeah, like, we never did that shit with each other. Like, that, everything was always something I kept to myself, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like, but, but you know, so, and you're obviously, like, busy, like, you know, you're making some shit shake for yourself. Now, for you to be in this, like, you know, you started doing a couple tracks, like, I mean, whenever I listen to your music, I, I, I'm very transparent to anyone on here. I'm not, like, a huge audiophile. Like, I'm not someone that's, like, you know, knows every track, knows everything about, you know, all these music. I've listened to Ready to Die probably 300 times in my life. I still don't know all the lyrics. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it's just interesting to, like, hear how you guys, like, kind of came back together with it all. Now, you started to do these couple tracks. I mean, what what happens after you put out this like first little bit of music? Like, are you getting like some sort of like recognition from it? Like, are people like noticing who you are and shit? Yeah. Like XXL did like a little, like a complex, like they all like, like posted it like that. Like, you know, um, I think XXL did like a little thing on it. Like they, or they did like regions. They do like a thing like we're yeah. East Southwest or something like that. And, yeah. they, and I was the East one. Like, so it was like, it got a little hype, like Absol was on it. Like, you know, um, but I think it was really obvious that like, you know, what it was like, it was somebody, I think the work always speaks for itself. And I think it was really obvious what it was that it wasn't like I had like mastered any craft. Like it was just me like grinding at it. Well, no, it was just me wilding out, like making songs and kind of being flaky with it and being in mm. and out of it. And I think, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really like putting in the work like I am today pers yeah. persistently. I was all over the place. So like, like, what was your process like back then? Are you just like going in there and like freestyling shit? Or are you just like, are you someone that got to write shit down all the time? Um, 
Yeah, no, I would never freestyle stuff. I always, I always take it, take it with me and write at home by myself. And like, I'll never, I could never do something like on the spot. Like I've just never been like that. I'm just not that kind of a thinker. You're not going to freestyle before you get off this pod. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I can't freestyle. just kidding, dude. I never <laughs> ask anyone to do that. <laughs> just but, run a beat real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I know it's kind of weird. I don't, but yeah. And like, um, I don't know. I've always been like that. Well, I forgot I was just saying like your process of like, you know, how you wrote yeah, back yeah. then. If you're like, I was all over the place. Like I would basically like just get inspired by something, sit down, but like I was running around the street. So like that was my main gig, Yeah, you know? And then it would just be like, you know, I was doing petty stuff. I was doing stupid stuff. Like, you know, and that would be my main thing is, you know, uh, you know, I would come back and like, I would just be flaky with that. I, could, I wasn't sticking to anything. And like, basically uh, I put out like, basically Instead, like, you know, when you, when you make a project, you want to make a good amount of work and like pick the best of the work and like really, you know, master the craft or like whatever. But like, this was just basically like my first 10 songs that I got off. I just like made a project to yeah. like, and tried to like, you know, wrap around the hype of like, you know, Mac helping me with it. Yeah. And, and that's not how, you know. And Did like, you feel a lot of that though? That you were just like, you know, did you think that that was like, you know, a factor for some people? Like you were like Max dude and like you were getting some buzz from that? Well, yeah, I think that was definitely like, you know, anything it had going for it was just that like you know and it was you know i liked my verses like i don't want to discount myself like i yeah. was i was getting started to where i am now like you know with very multi-syllable verses and like you know i have some really good verses yeah, on your there. shit is complex now like i had to rewind shit and like listen through it again because i would just miss stuff it's like yeah i know it, it's i need style I'm trying is wild. To, yeah i'm trying to like i'm trying to get better at cutting cutting it down and uh, i don't think i don't think that you should I don't think you need to get better at cutting down. I think it's just a different style of hearing it because it's like, you know, my wife, uh, we were driving and, uh, you know, you guys sent me the tape and I was like, I want to listen to this like while, while we're going it. And like, you know, she's not someone who's a big hip hop head, but I see her sitting there like listening. And she was like, this is some, this is some heavy shit too. And it's like, you, you don't, you don't have to be like a hip hop head to be able to like understand that, but it's not like a style that I hear all the time. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, uh, you're, that's what it reminded me of. It reminded me like you're just reading a fucking journal. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like, so that style back then and like how you're kind of like creating music. Now, you, you, I feel like you often hear, you know, people like, you know, Kurt Cobain, like anyone who's like on drugs, that people say that that's like the best music that comes out of that, 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 that it, that it <laughs> brings the, the good music from that. Did you feel like... You said that's a lie. Yeah, it's such a lie. It's such a bullshit. Like you, you, you. If you, if there's anything, if you make amazing music because you're on drugs, it's because you think you're making amazing music because you're doing drugs. Like it's mm. whatever you think, you know. And like you know, um, a lot of people I know, and then I found out the truth that like how much that of a lie that is because I found out a lot of people and I found out a lot of work where people are doing their absolute best work with their clear mind. Yeah, you know, and uh, and uh, you know. Um, and like I said, it's just kind of like this, like, you know, fantasy, like, you know, uh, stupid little like illusion that like, you know, you build you, in your head. Yeah. Or like you, you do drug and like, you know, or you like see, you need it to be creative or something. Yeah. And you grow up like, what you know, I grew up watching the doors, Jim Morrison, like, yeah. um, you know, like, um, that was a big aspect too. I went through this whole phase where I was like real heavy into classic rock. And so like Jimi Hendrix and like acid and like, yeah. I was real into, uh, Hunter S. Thompson, there was like a point where like me and my friends were like a drug crowd when we moved here. Like I hung out with like all these like little street kids in Squirrel Hill, like up at the benches. And like, we were like just these little kids that like just did all any drugs we could get our hands off of. Like I remember us in a, in a playground, like huffing ether um, when I, we were like 15, 16 years old. Yeah. Like, and I don't know, it just kind of like, you know, attracted this little crowd of like, you know, kids that did drugs. And like, I, I just, I'm fortunate, like became a part of it, unfortunately. Jerm, for you to be someone who's like a producer that works with all kinds of like bigger name people, you know, like over the years, I'm sure you've experienced like, you know, people feeling that they need a substance to make them creative. Like you experience that a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like, do, but do you see like the negative of that? Like, is there anyone that ever thinks that and like just fucks themselves, gets too fucked up in a booth and like can't, fu can't do anything? Yeah. I mean, I've seen it, especially with alcohol. Yeah. I was one of them. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, there you go. I've seen, I've definitely seen people like drink too much and yeah, can't even like just slurring. Actually, Mac one time drank like two forties and then tried to rap and it didn't work. Yeah. Just an example. But I mean, there's definitely you been smoke? Other, a little bit. Yeah. Like, I mean, like I, I, I know you drink a little bit and uh, you like that, but it's like, 
do you think that uh like like are you someone that like will drink or smoke before you like work no is that something that you you can't like do that i just i realized like i've you know, I need a clear mind to yeah. to do what I want. And that doesn't mean other people can't. No, like no, a lot I get of people it. with weed, especially, it's like, I get it. With yeah. me, it's like, I overthink, you know, if, uh, I'm, if I'm high, like I'm making beats, I'm overthinking every little aspect. So it makes it so much worse. Like I've, I found that out years ago. Your own worst enemy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then alcohol, like, yeah, there's just like a, there's a fine line. It's like, it's cool to like take the edge off a little bit, but you know, I don't want to take it too far because then I'm, it's just like my focus kind of goes away. So now it's just coffee. Usually <laughs> <laughs> a lot of coffee yep. now for you. Like, I mean, to be where you are now, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've never been an addict to anything. So like, I know that it's like a everyday struggle. Like I know that like, I mean, are you someone that like goes to, like meetings and stuff like that? Like, are, are you constantly like working at this? Uh, I did for like three years. Yeah. Um, I went to meetings, but I, um, kind of just found my like own kind of, uh, you know, thing. And like, like I said, I'm not, I'm not like some like professional or anything, but I started smoking weed and like, I, I, you know, and, uh, basically I've just been living right. You know, I haven't, I grew up like, not only did I grow up like doing, um, you know, drugs, but like, I was like a thief. I always, I just was kind of like a thief from an early age. I was always like that. I was always like a liar. I was always a cheater. Like I, that's just kind of how I grew up. I was like this little, yeah. like bad kid. And, uh, you know, and I kind of, in my personal experience just found that like me living right and like living honestly and uh you know has like helped me you know get to where i am today and i'm just so thankful for that that like you know i couldn't imagine like going back to where i was yeah and i don't like i don't know just personally like to each his own and like you know i think that we can be definitely like a trigger like if you you know you connotate it with that lifestyle like but like for me uh you know i've been good thus far and like i've been really enjoying myself and i wrote this whole album while while i was smoking but i certainly recorded it like I, whenever anytime i recorded i was i, was, I wouldn't, wouldn't smoke yeah like i recorded the whole thing um when i would usually when i would wake up in the morning before i would smoke and i would make sure i was clear-headed and you know what i mean now for you to you know, like, do you ever, it's like, what's that period of time whenever you're like, you know, you're sober and then you're like, oh, I'm going to try smoking again. Like, is that a scary time for you to like, it actually was, I bet it would be. Cause you know, um, because you know, you're kind of told, like I was kind of sat down and told that like I had this disease yeah, and that it was incurable. And that like, if I go near anything that has to do with drugs that like, I'm going to like die, Quicksand. you know, like, and, uh, you know, so uh, and and right like I understand why there's a lot of fear around that. Of course, people are dying left and right from overdoses. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, um, so there's a lot of fear wrapped around it for me. Like, uh, you know, and uh, but like, you know, so yeah, so so yeah, definitely. Um, I've just heard that term, you know, California sober. You know, I've I've heard that <laughs> I've heard that be a uh, a more used term. Like, I, I was watching Rogan and he had uh, like uh, Domi Lovato on. She was talking about how she was like. Uh, you know, she was recovering and then like smoking weed. And he was asking like, you know, is that like, you know, is that type of shit like looked down upon from people that like you came up with in recovery that like might not choose to do it that way? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I just think like to each his own. And if yeah. like somebody, like there was a time where I didn't want to be around weed either. And, yeah. it was, and it was because my life had gotten that bad. And like, um, I just needed to clear my space and uh, get away from everything. Like I think, I was clean, completely clean for three years. Yeah. And, I, and I think that was really good for me. And I think like, you know, being honest with myself was the most important thing. Like being hundred percent honest with myself. Um, first off was, was how like, you know, um, I got clean in the first place, but like, you know, um, it was just like, uh, so I just felt like I was doing what was right for me. And like, you know, then I ended up smoking and like, you know, I was, yeah, I was scared at first. I was, I thought, you know, uh, you know, just what everybody just keeps says. going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, long story short, like I, you know, I ended up kind of like, you know, finding a, a, a medium space. Ground. Yeah. And I just kind of felt like, you know, I was in a good place and I felt confident and I felt like I was in a good place and like I started smoking. So, you know, are you I don't no. know. This is the thing though, is I would like to, is I'm no professional. So for no, all, no, no, I get it. You know, so for all I know, like, you know, like, 
You know what I mean? I, I've been good thus far and I can say that for myself. Yeah, you find what works for you and you're, exactly. you, know, you and follow I, it like that. Yeah, so I would just say, you know, just be honest with yourself. I don't think anyone's listening to this yeah, podcast yeah, yeah. for guidance in life. You know, <laughs> more just listening about, you know, how people are uh, navigating through it. Now, I mean, you you said you guys worked together like 10 years ago. It's like, when did this come into play? When did big and when, when did big waves come into play? Like, when was the first idea? How did you guys come up with this? Well, um... The I name is I, dope. The name is dope. I have to say that, the was, al- that was Bill's. The album cover is wild. What grade were you in both in in that? I think I was like sixth. I was in like sixth too. Yeah. Uh, you guys look sick in them pictures. <laughs> well, we did that because we did that too because I was like around the age we both skated. So that yeah. was something that that's something that me and Jeremy kind of found a common from the beginning. It's like we both skated, so it's kind of. But I quit. So, but like it would be something. Like, oh, you you skated and like you wear the Vans and yeah Supreme and stuff like that. And then uh, you know. I ended up, I started skating again, so. And then I think when Bill kind of started coming around more, like, I think I started seeing you more again, like 2018, like early 2018. And then I moved to Atlanta, like in October. Of 2018? Mm Mm-hmm. And you're back up here now? Yep. You hated Atlanta? I I don't hate it. It's just like, I don't know. I just wasn't what you wanted. I mean, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other aspects too. Yeah. It's not just Atlanta. It was like literally the month before I moved, Mac passed away. Yeah. I was there two weeks, came back for the memorial. You know what I mean? And then six months after that, my dad got diagnosed with cancer. Oh shit. So I was up here. I was up here a lot actually, uh, two years ago, like in the summer, um, you know, just helping my mom, helping my dad, like all that kind of stuff. So that was, and then he passed away in August, two years ago. And then you know, six months after that, it's COVID. So there were just like a lot of different things while I was in Atlanta that it wasn't like, I wouldn't totally blame it on Atlanta. It was just, yeah, it's like, just like a perfect storm of shit. Six months before all that, he had gotten shot in Highland Park. Well, two, year, two years, two before years moved, before that, it okay. was 2016. I got shot. I don't work. Oh my God. I, f- I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just like, there were a whole lot of different things in the past five years. So wait, did I talk to you after you got shot? Right. Uh-huh. Wow. I forgot all about that. That's crazy. I forget about it sometimes, honestly. Yeah, that's wild. Until you fucking sorry to bring it up. No, that's cool. <laughs> that's I'm like, wild. I'm, I've done like therapy and shit since then. Yeah, like since even I've talked to you, I've done therapy, and like PTSD type shit. Yeah, um, because it was weird. It was what I did after I got shot. It was like that happened on a Monday. I got out on Friday. I was back in the studio that next Monday. Like, I was just pretending like I'm just gonna stay busy, and then I, it won't even affect me. You know yeah. what I mean? And that that shit doesn't work. You felt, you felt effects from that? Like, like, like what kind of shit was happening to you? You like walking down the road and like just have anxiety and shit. Yeah, definitely bad anxiety. Um, sleeping. Yeah. I wasn't sleeping real well. Um, it was just a lot of things I could just tell it was affecting my life. Like I was like, I was drinking too much because I was, you know, compensating somehow, you know, trying to like numb whatever. So yeah, I mean, therapy is a good thing. Now, it, whenever you were down there, I mean, like, for, luckily for you, 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 you know, you're making beats. You don't have to be at a place. So mm-hmm. if you're in quarantine, you know, you're just locked in your house making, you probably get a lot of shit done then. Mm-hmm. It's like, what is like pandemic like down there? Is, is it, was Atlanta like super wild? It was funny because it was like that shit wasn't even happening. Like there would still be like line, like there'd be like lines of cars, like trying to go to the strip club and shit. This is really? like last summer, like, <laughs> and I was just kind of you know, me and Michelle were just inside. Like all I would really do is like walk my dog. That's like the only shit I would do outside and like maybe yeah. pick up food somewhere. But I mean, for you, like, you know, or I mean to be a, you know, that's your job is to produce things and make beats and everything like that. It's like, what's your everyday life? Like, are, are you, are you someone that just works whenever you're feeling it? Or are you someone that like, you know, sets aside time and is like putting in hours every day, regardless if you know what you're doing or not? Yeah, I kind of have to set aside time. Yeah. Um, and then I do other things too. Like, you know, I mix songs yeah. for other people and master and all that stuff. So it's like those things, it's not so much about feeling creative. It's just more like getting it done and yeah, and it's doing like, it right. It's the job part, but it's not like, you know, I don't want to make that sound negative that it's the job. No, part, but, but it's, it's not, like, you know, it's not you creating exactly. something like that. And then with, you know, with the production part, it's more like, I do try to set aside time, but I also like, I've been doing this shit long enough that I don't force it. Like if I'm not feeling it, there's really no reason to even attempt anything yeah, creative. Just waste time. Yeah, it's like, it's you like, obviously know how, when, when shit's going to happen and when and not. It's like, I know if I'm going to hate it or not. So yeah. it's like, 
sometimes it's just more frustrating than anything. So now both ends being like people who create things like, do you, are you real critical of what you're making? Like, Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's trash. Yeah. Are you, and and you're someone that's like super critical about things. Even on the way over here, like I made a beat like right before we came and I was like playing in the car and I was telling him before I even played it, I was like, I don't even know if I like it yet or whatever. (laughs) And then he actually liked it, but fire. Yeah. It's just, it's like that. I mean, I generally don't like anything I do. You know what I mean? Like there's a certain point where it's like, I'll feel confident enough about it to like send it to somebody or whatever. Yeah. But just when you know, like every little aspect that went into it, like I can pick it apart and make anything. I, you For know, sure. Anything I make, I can make in my mind. It sucks because I can pick apart every little thing, but what do you like talk to any artist and like, they could say they could spend forever on, mm-hmm. on a, on one single piece. So it's like, it's pretty wild to think about that. Now, when did you start writing? And when did you finish writing for like this, for this, for big waves? Like when did that, when did that start? So quick backstory. So when Jerm moved to uh, Atlanta, Mm -hmm. I had like a couple real like pathetic attempts to like try and replace him. And it was like, (laughs) and it's not talking bad on like the people that I did, but like that I was trying to work with, but it was like, you know, and I'm talking about as an engineer, not a producer. I get it. Cause, um, and, uh, you know, and me and Jerm just had, you know, I knew how he worked and he, and you know, whatever. And, um, I was used to working with him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I realized that like, you know, I was having some trouble like connecting with any, with somebody else, uh, in person. And so, uh, Jerm was like, yo, uh, you could actually probably just record yourself at home. And I was like, man, that would be crazy if I could do that. Because like a lot of my stuff is real complicated. Yeah. A lot of, so I would tie, I was, a lot of times I would try and go to the studio and I have a lot of trouble, like, like, uh, pronouncing the verse I just wrote yeah you know and so like I had a lot of trouble so I I took a lot of trial and error for me and so I had to do that by myself and I couldn't do that like paying six dollars an hour at a studio like off of money like when I'm trying to recover my life you yeah know? for like, sure that's understandable and, um, and so germ you know, came up with a solution for me to uh you know I bought a mic and and a, a reflection filter and a little booth and uh and I started recording a song started recording myself and uh, I started sending the sessions to German Atlanta when he moved. And that was like a game changer. And like, uh, I had been really trying to write. Um, I'd been writing different songs and I was on this kick where I was doing a lot of stuff with no drums. E Dan ended up sending me some, that was the intro for For the Lost Children. Um, um, but uh, I was doing a lot of different stuff with no drums and experimenting with different things. And I, but Germ has sent me this pack in 2017 and 2018. So the one that you're using for big waves? Oh yeah, and some, not- Some of it, yeah. Some of it, yeah. Okay, and then, um, and then also some of it is as old as two thousand eight, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So that's crazy. So this isn't so a lot. So like you know, when you're looking at this project and this catalog of songs that we have, like it's not just something that like it you was, guys just threw together. This is something that has been growing and and, and these building. are like these are beats and samples that I've just been sitting here since the beginning of everything we've been talking about. And like you know, so this is like really full circle stuff. Wow, that's pretty wild to think that that some of that work is that old. Yeah, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. And like you know, so I started to realize like I was at I was with E in the studio one day, or I was just thinking I was like, man you guys just like make beats all day and like I was like you guys probably have a ton of beats that nobody uses that's what i was just gonna say like if you had to make and if you had to make a, a ballpark guess like how much shit do you have that is just like not used that, that you just have on a backlog well my like project folder of beats so it doesn't mean they're all good or anything like that yeah but there's almost like eleven thousand in there so if you think about even like all the shit that has come out yeah that's like it's only like a small percentage of that small, small percent of it. Ridiculous. Not to mention the shit you probably just throw away from the beginning. Right. I don't don't like, I don't ever throw anything away. So that's part of it. Like that's part of why there's so many beats in there. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there's some shit I would never play for anybody. And then there's some (laughs) that like, you know, like these ones where, you know, he kind of asked me for some of those ones that like maybe nobody heard or like nobody's used from whenever. And then maybe those got like, I changed the drums or something for him. But yeah, like, there's probably stuff even older than that. Cause I've been making beats since like 2003 and there's sometimes I would like sample something and then it never turned out the way I wanted it. And yeah. then I would pull it up later. So it's like, it's hard for, to even tell for you to uh, like, I, this might be a stupid question. Forgive me if it's dumb, but for, do people like approach you and like, will they give you like a direction of, of a beat? Like, are, are you someone that like, you know, I could say like, Oh, I want something kind of like this. Do you do shit like that? Or are you, you know, are you like, I'm making what I want now. 
Um, it depends. Like I'll do, I'll do both yeah. kind of things. Like, I mean, there's certain things where I'm like, I just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like not like in a negative way. It's just like, yeah, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Like just, that. you should find that dude who made that beat. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Cause like, I didn't know if it was like someone, you know, I'm sure people hire you from your name as well. So it's like, people were like, Oh, I'm looking for like a certain sound. I didn't mm-hmm. know if that was like something you did because you're obviously you're fucking established enough to be able to just pick and choose the work that you want. So it's interesting to hear like how that is uh, for you. You know, like, how hard was it for you to select? How many tracks are on there? Uh, are on the project 13. Yeah, 13. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 13. So how, like how long did it take you to like pick them to pick them beats? Um, so we got like, um, so, uh, so anyways, like we, he sent me that folder of beats in like 2017. I was like, yo, uh, that was when I kind of caught wind of it. And I'm like, I, I don't have any money and I'm like trying to make music and I'm like, yo, like, um, you know, so I'm looking for like any spare beats, you know what I mean? And so, yeah. you know, but Jerm always hooked up. He didn't just send me like the trash, like or anything, but like Jerm sent me a giant pack of beats. And then like all, most of the beats, I think are all the beats were in these packs. And so I'm going through these in 2017 and I'm like writing to them, but I, I can't get them how I liked them. Yeah. I can't get, I, I wasn't like there yet with my work. Are you someone that ha- that writes lyrics after hearing a beat or do you just write lyrics down and then try to format it to a beat? No, I, I, I can do different stuff. Sometimes I'll, st- if I, if I like write anything before I listen to something, it's something small and yeah. then I, I take it from there. Yeah. But like, uh, but most of the time I just listen to a beat and write to it. And that's how I always did. Just write on my phone. I never wrote with paper or pen. Mm-hmm. I was me, like me and Mac, we always started writing on our phones. We, we used to write on our blackberries yeah and i just that's and that's I, how i remember that blackberries were so sick so that's how i always remember like mac holding up the blackberry and so i started writing on my blackberry too and that's how we always wrote and so i would always just like turn on a beat and just write my phone yeah and that's how we always did it and uh you know and so long, and long story short so he sent me those beats and i couldn't tackle them how i wanted to I, I remember i went into the studio and i was trying to do a couple and i was paying for sessions and i didn't really have much money at all yeah and so like i i like so for me it was like a big deal to pay for like a hundred dollars for a session like that week like i wouldn't be able to afford to do, i would be able to afford to do that like twice a month yeah you know and so like um so like i had to come with it and then whenever i came with it like i realized that like you know i couldn't really pronounce the, my verses how I, you know that i would write and so I, like i had a lot of work to do if i wanted to like um if i wanted to get my verses where i wanted them yeah and so i had these all these beats since 2017 and i was trying to land them and i couldn't do it i couldn't didn't like anything of it um and i would just end up being like yeah uh, I, I I didn't do that, and so like um and then long story short, but I would but Jerm was my engineer regardless. So yeah. he so he would always record me, and he would always mix my songs. So that's why we were always connected because any music I would did, he would be mixing and working on. And so then when he moved, um, long story short, I just kind of stayed in position. So I just kept writing, and like even though I couldn't really land Jerm's beats the way I wanted to, I put them down for a while, and I started doing other stuff. I started doing different stuff and no drums, this and that. And then that ended up being like a lot of stuff from For the Lost Children, a lot of the stuff from my tape, The Yellow Ghost and Wings of Birds. That's all from this, like this period. First of all, I wrote most of that on city buses, like taking buses to different jobs and stuff like that. Like trying to put my life back together after I sold Daily Bread. And like, um, and, uh, you know, I just basically, my motivation was just to tell my honest story. And like, you know, so I was just trying to tell my story on all this different music, like all the time and just trying to like figure out how I can like, like tell this whole story in one song or this and that. And then, so long story short, like over a period of time, I would, I would chip away at a germ beat here and there. And then like shot four, one, two freestyle, like four and two, the guys at four and two, they like paid for a beat one time because they knew like I didn't have money and I was like trying to make music still. So they like paid for a beat and that turned out to be the shot four and two freestyle Uh for the Carhartt. um, It was like 2017. Yeah. They did a release with Carhartt and they like paid for that beat. They like did, um, we ended up doing like a video to it and we called it the shop 412 freestyle. Um, and, uh, they had me and Jerm like decked out and all their like car art stuff. And it was real dope. And I was really happy with how that song came out. Like I was like, man, this is crazy. But like, yeah. um, to me, it felt like I, my confidence still wasn't there. Cause I was still putting my life back together. I still, you know, would be down on myself sometimes like, man, you know, and, the, but, um, what's it called? Uh, I just kind of, Kept plugging away at it, kept plugging away at different stuff. And then long, and then, um, when I lived in Highland Park last summer over quarantine, um, I just happened to crack open the folder again and like this gasket just blew and I just started just rapping on all of them. Like 
that's it in a nutshell is like i basically was just trying experimenting with different stuff for years and i couldn't get to these german beats how i liked them and then yeah. I, I finally took another go at it and i started to really like feel like i was connecting the verses that i wanted to and rapping them the way that i wanted to and that is this collection of songs and it's like we did like um like 35 or close to 35 songs and we're you just, two did 35 songs and then you just chose 13 to put on this album yeah since august yeah yeah Jeez. and there'll probably be a sequel at least one sequel <clears throat> wow yeah. and there's some that probably just won't come out but that's how that's how it goes real big waves yeah, yeah. <laughs> sequel uh for you two to like you know i mean is it like how do i want to phrase it it's like if you listen to a beat and you like you know you come up with like a verse with it and like you need like the structure of a beat change is that like something that you do mm-hmm. like do you guys like forgive me for asking these like you know rudimentary it questions could go so many different ways like there's sometimes where like i'll send it <coughs> there's one time where i sent a sample to germ like i, yeah. I sampled a couple of things and he, like we had this song called malice in the rabbit hole and i basically just like sampled this um song out of a movie i saw and sent it to germ and he made that beat mm-hmm. so he basically just heard the sample and like did something dark off of it and uh you know so many different ways like it could come about germ's pretty much open to every anything so like yeah. he would always be like yo if you want to restructure this let me know how you want to do it but for all pretty much all these tracks it would be rarely we would do that like i would just i just left it the same exact format he sent it to me like a minute and a half yeah and i would just be like yo how can i be like the most entertaining over this minute and a half right now and just like say some crazy stuff and like also tell my story in a very honest way too so like all the like hard stuff we're talking about. I mean, you heard the project. So. Yeah, it's definitely like uh, as I go through and I listen to it. I mean, you obviously have people that are like rapping and shit like that, just like flexing on stuff and like just trying to do it, talking about like fucking bitches and like you know in the yeah. club, whatever, like that. It's like it's nothing of what you write. It's like everything I listen to from there is like I'm the opposite of that. Yeah, oh, yeah, but I mean, like it's also like I, I don't know. I feel like I feel like I. I feel like I have to be like, you know, ready to like, you know, consume what you're like putting on there. And like, I feel like that that's a good thing because like, it makes you feel something different. You know, some people will put on like fucking some random ass shit and it's like, that's something you can just cruise down, you know, like, but it's like, I I don't know. Your, your shit is almost reminds me of like listening to a record. It's like, I got to like, kind of like prepare for it and like want to jump through it. And it's interesting because like your beats are so like, I mean, you sample like a lot of like, uh, you know, like the old shit and it's, I don't know. It's, it works well together because I had, uh, I had, uh, a couple other people that, you know, that I got to sit down and talk to. And it's like, I, I listen to everyone's process and how everyone like puts shit together. And then I'm able to like hear the final product mm-hmm. of it all. And it's just like such a, you know, bizarre adventure through it all. What, uh, now where do you, where do you get creativity now? Like you're obviously doing way better with your life right now. It seems to be that you're, you know, more confident and you're happy with, you know, kind of where you are. It's like, where's the, you know, I feel like that your whole 15 years before this is very dark, you know, it's, it's, it's a very dark thing. So for you to be in this period where you're at now, where do you get creativity from? Where do you get like, you know, where do you get your ideas from? Like, did you, did you know that you wanted to just make this like a raw ass fucking, you know, tape about your life or. I th- I just think it's really important to like, uh, you know, tell your story. Like to me, I see a lot of people get clean like I did. And like a lot of people might think it's stupid that I carry it with me that like, you know, that I carry, you know, I'm always talking about my past and this and that. Um, but to me, it's like, you know, a big purpose is behind it because like, I remember the first time that like, you know, somebody told me about their past and said something that I did that I hated myself for. Yeah. And it just felt like a boulder was taken off my back. Yeah. And so that was my heavy, heavy inspiration to start writing. And like, um, that was my purpose. It wasn't about like, you know, that's what I just felt like my purpose was is to just like tell the honest story. And like, I, so I kind of like was always part of the hype and like, you know, being a part of this world, um, where, you know, it's all about like money and this and that culture and the hype and this and that. And I just got so sick of it. And I just realized like once I like gave away everything from my addiction yeah, and it got to that point. It's like, all I have left is like my story. Like, I just want to tell my story. Yeah. And I just want to tell it honestly. And I, and like, man, it makes my stomach turn to say some of the stuff I do, but I feel like it's so important. I feel like there's a purpose behind it so I can do it. And I build myself to do that. 
Yeah, I think it's important for sure, especially like for, you know, even like conversations like this, you know, I'm obviously not a professional of all this stuff, but I feel like it's important to hear people's experiences because, you know, you were, I mean, a pretty deep, pretty deep water. It sounded like, and it's like, it's, it's, it's motivational to hear for people to be able to like, know that it's possible to like get through there at all. And like, I feel like you could hear that in, in, in your music. Like you could hear that it like, like, I don't know. It's almost like, it it almost sounds like painful for you to like, to, to put it on there. And I'm sure it was, but, uh, you know, you're doing it for a reason for other people to be able to grab something from there and like take something away from that and like be able to hear like the good and the bad out of it. Yeah. And plus I just love telling stories. Like I don't shut up. Like a lot of the time, like I'm definitely one of those people. Like I remember like being in the room with all my friends who are younger and like, hey, Bill, shut up. Or like, you know, Bill, you told us that story 10 times, yeah. you know, I'm a storyteller. And that's what I realized. Um, like, where I fit in into making tracks uh, in hip hop as as a storyteller, yeah, and uh, you know, and so I just basically like fit, like wrote until I could tell stories the way I wanted to over music, and then once I was able to like, that's when the gasket kind of blew, and I felt like real confident, and that just happened like last summer, so that was four years after I got clean, yeah, and just stayed in position and just kept writing, kept writing, kept writing. That's the only thing I did is just keep writing, and things aligned and like me and I like there was a point where I never probably never thought I'd talk to Jerome again like I thought I'd never be talk to anybody like I thought my life was over like you know there was a point where like we didn't talk for years it's not like we've all we've been buds through all this like yeah it, we've had rocky roads I get it you know and but like like I got back in position and like to me it was about like you know like a redemption like you should have been like you should have been staying in a position back then 10 years ago when you were first brought down to ID labs and you had, and you were put in front of German. Like, yeah. you know, that's what I wish I was able to just focus back then. But I, you know, I am here now and I'm focusing now and the, you know, I'm, I'm just really happy with what I make. Like some of it's me talking shit. Some of it's me, you know, being an idiot. Some of it's me telling real stuff, you know? Yeah. For you, Germ, to be, uh, you know, you're obviously like working with all these different artists. Every artist is their own, you know, do you, like, do you ever come in to play, not even with just Bill, but like, do you ever come into play with like, like you not being able to like figure out people as far as like the way, like their styles, like I'm sure you worked, I mean, you've worked with hundreds of people. It's like, do you ever come into play with that? It's like, are you pretty much like, you know, you're obviously professional, you know, you could get by with it. I'm sure. Um, when you say their styles, what do you mean? It's like, like he has a very complex style. You know what I mean? It's not something that's like, you know, some of the shit that you did for Max, some of the shit you did for Wiz, it, like none of it sounds the same whatsoever. Like, do you ever have any sort of like feeling of like, uh, what's the word? It's like, you know, someone who's a professional pool player could play pool, you know, with their fucking eyes closed. They just, it's muscle memory now, mm-hmm. you know, like, do you ever have that feeling of just like, all right, I got to figure this out. This is a problem. I have to figure this out. It's like, I, I have to figure out this puzzle. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know. I It's like, I don't want to make the same beat every time. So yeah. it's like, maybe I'll make something and I, I'm like, oh yeah, this whiz would sound good on this. So I just send it to him. You know what I mean? I mean, like, did any of the things that like he sent you, was it like complicated to like put together at all for you? A little bit. Cause, um, you know, just there's a lot, like he kind of, he says it too, but he like jams a lot into like each bar. You yeah. know what I mean? So word cramming. Grip yeah. my boy grip. Shout my boy grip. He's saying word cramming. <laughs> word cramming. <laughs> so some of that and then it's like, yeah, maybe just like try to clean it up a little bit or yeah. or whatever. Like but I there's a fine line because it's like you want people to do what they do. I'm not trying to control the yeah. whole situation, but um, that's more like the angle that I'm looking at. It's like, you know, if he's trying to, you obviously are writing these verses. You have like, you know, if you're writing a story in a song, can't really cut out some of the important parts of it all. I mean, I'm sure you did, but you know, you have to kind of figure out a way to make it sound good because you're putting your name on it as well. You know, you're putting your name on it as well. You guys want to be, you know, like you guys wanted to both represent yourself <clears throat> to the highest, it could, highest level it could be. It's like, did it, did it come together smoothly for you both? Um, I mean, there's been like some of those songs, there were like 10 versions, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's kind of what's good about him having a home studio. It's like he can, if he's listening to it and it's like, I don't like this one bar, he can change it. Or if I tell him like, 
I think you could do this bar cleaner or yeah. whatever. Even like the other day we had to, I had to like re-upload everything cause there was like one bar that was sticking out. You know what I mean? Mm. So um, is that easy for you both to like, are you both able to like spot that easily? You know, I mean, obviously yeah. you have a, you know, you have a, a trained eye, but for me, it's like, like you sent me the link. You were like, oh, he, I know he emailed you the, the final version, but here's the link because we changed one thing. You probably wouldn't even, you know, you obviously yeah, wouldn't yeah. even know. It's <laughs> like for you to like, listen through that. Does that shit like eat at you? If you hear like one small thing? Yeah. If it pops out to me, sometimes it takes a little bit to pop out to me. Like yeah. sometimes I'll be so focused on one part of the song or one aspect of the song that like it'll take me putting it down for a month and picking it back up to realize like, Oh, I pronounced the word crown, like in a weird way. You can't really, you can't really hear what I'm saying. Yeah. And I am like real multi-syllable. So that's my struggle is like, that's what like, you know, I love like, you know, uh, you know, that's just the kind of lyricism I love. And so it's been a struggle with me to try to make it, to be able to make something that people can interact with too. Cause I want to, I want to, you know, um, you know, contribute something. I want people to be able to like, you know, here. So I do in a way, like I do want to cut down my word cramming. Yeah. You know what I mean? And be a little, but you know, there's, you know, I don't know. You but, still got to like, you still want to put the content that you want it to be in there. So it's been a balance of that. Yeah. I think like, there's a lot of stuff like, you know, um, and like all these, like, you know, songs that we did since August where like, you know, it's like my verse is like too long or this and that, but like, I love it anyway. It's like, a, you know, I feel like it's, you know, some, you know, I want to put out anyway or, or this and that it's just this is my process and i feel it but like it's finally the work is finally in a place where i feel good with sharing it you yeah. know like I, I i would spit on germ beast back in 2017 i would i was probably like you know number ones i wrote to and i wouldn't even share with germ what i wrote yeah or, or you know what uh so how did you guys come up i mean where did the name i mean who came up with the name like how did that come together so bill <laughs> yeah so like uh so i put out my tape and uh, I hadn't really been doing barely any germ beats. Yeah. Like, so germ has been my, was my engineer for years, but like um, at, at this point, like I probably only done like five of his beats, like in the past in, in two years. Yeah. And um, what's it called? And uh, I'm sorry, what was the question again? I was saying like, uh, how did the names come into play? Okay. And so, um, and so basically um, uh, I, I just saw all these people putting out joint albums. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I've seen several people like put out joint albums and combine the names. And so I just thought, you know, Big Germ, you know, I just, it's just a, you know, his first name and my last name. Yeah. I mean, it came together yeah, well. Like, and, it's a so, super sick mm -hmm. name. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, that's so tight. And so like, uh, I've like, I used to, re I read plays a lot. And so I read this wow. play um, that was basically like all these different segments and different stories of this woman's life. And they were all over the place, yeah. but it still kind of gave you the full picture. And so uh -huh. I was like, you know what? Like. I could just take all these pieces of production. Um, and now that I was, now that I was able to tell stories and, and, and put verses down the way that I wanted to, and I felt confident with it. Yeah. I was like, I, I hit up germ and I was like, yo, I was like, um, and also it ties back to like, I don't have any money. You know what I mean? So I'm like, yo germ, like if I, um, like, you know, take, like take like a bunch if i use a bunch of your beats and we put it out together as both of our music like would you be down to do that because like i didn't have you know the money to like you know find yeah. a producer and yeah, for uh, sure and pay for a bunch of beats on my own you know and so it was a joint thing so i you know i needed help and so me and germ came together with that and uh and you know we decided to put it out jointly and i always like it's always been something to me where like you know um you know, the producer, I always feel like is, you know, never gets the credit and like this and that. And like, you know, usually people like take pieces of all different producers to make their own album and give them their own shine. Yeah. But like, I really feel like, you know, in a lot of different ways, like some ways we aren't some, but a lot of ways we're cut from the same cloth. Um, and like, you know, um, and I really just want to, you know, to do a joint project as a duo, you know? I think it's sick that you guys had like, you know, it, it, it all came full circle as far because like you guys obviously seen each other whenever you both first started, you've had, you know, you experienced the same, you know, success and loss of your friends. And it's like, you saw his dark times, you saw him like rise to where he is now. And uh, it obviously like speaks volumes for you to like, you know, because if you were obviously, you know, if you were just being, 
not the person that you are now, I'm sure you wouldn't even, you would notice and you wouldn't even put in the time of day to work with You wouldn't him. even talk to me. You, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I feel like it speaks volumes that like, you know, you're grinding at it. You know, you could really hear that like it's a quality product, like the whole tape. It's consistent through and, uh, you, you know, like there's still differences in each of the tracks. Like, uh, cause some of the, I mean, some of them that were switching back and forth, I was like making sure that I was on like, you know, the, the, cause you sent me the SoundCloud link. I don't ever fucking go on SoundCloud. I feel like it's the hardest thing to ever use. Uh, so I'm clicking all these and it's playing through. I just want to make sure that it was all going through and it all sounded consistent. Like I liked how it was, you know, uh, for you to have some old beats and shit on there. Are you someone that like lose it? Like things lose its shine. Um, probably, but I think with these, these were timeless. Yeah. I think. And the aspects of them were timeless. Like, you know, the same kind of beats are being put out today. Like, you know what I mean? And there's some on there where it was like, maybe there's, there's some beats on there where I was like, why didn't anybody pick this before? Like, maybe I still liked it from however long ago or, or I tweaked it a little bit since then. And then, you know, once he, once he rapped on it, it's like a whole different, a whole new thing. Like it takes on a life of its own at that point. It's That's not a good just point like, it's not just like a out. beat on my computer that nobody heard. It's like, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. And a lot of, obviously these are like soul sampled hip hop beats are a lot are different, like jazz sampled. And so I heard we were, um, uh, his engagement party, um, the other night and this, uh, whiz, uh, track came on and, uh, what be, what song was that? Take away, take away. And, um, Man, and and it's like you know a soul sample, uh, hip hop beat, and I'm like, wow, like I forgot how Wiz used to sound on beats like that. Yeah, and I was like, damn, and it's you know it's it's crazy how it, things do take on a life of their own because like Wiz on those on your beat on your hip hop beats is a whole nother thing, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. um, so yeah, it's crazy to think about that. It is. It's wild to think that like uh, one, I mean, one artist is going to be completely different than the other artist, and like the final product is going to be you know could be completely different but uh all right i mean so it drops tomorrow right friday we're gonna say that this is uh is this friday this is drops yeah so it drops tomorrow or saturday? Saturday. Saturday. saturday 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 what's the date the 17th or is friday the only reason i remember is because my engagement party was the 10th and then a week from then yep. yeah congratulations so on that thanks man it was uh we're supposed to have it last summer and then COVID ruined that. So yeah, that's how the world is now with everything. Mm-hmm. She does. Uh, my wife does wedding makeup, and it's oh, like she's really? just bombarded with all this shit now. Wow. It's like everyone had to like like push that shit back a year and a half. So now everyone's just like making up for it. I went to a wedding that I got three different invites for last month. It was supposed to be three different times. Wow. And just like it's. I don't know. It feels weird to like, what's it feel like to have some sort of like normalcy coming back for you guys? Like, I mean, we all obviously experienced, you know, a pandemic, even though you were kind of in the wild West, uh, (laughs) down in the South there, so to speak. But you know, what's it like for you to like, what's the normalcy like for you guys now? Like you do anything different? I don't know. I'm such an introvert. I kind of just kept to myself. Are you a pretty big introvert? Oh yeah. I don't go out. I don't do nothing. I just stay at home. Like, you know, um, what do you do for fun? Like you watching TV? Like, do you watch shows? Do you watch movies? Are you a movie head? I, I fall asleep to TV. Uh, <laughs> I do like me and my girl watch movies. Yeah. Uh, watch a lot of movies together. Um, so I kind of do that cause it's just what me and my girl like to do. But like, uh, you know, I take photos. I take a lot of photos. Yeah. I took a lot of, um, you know, I've done all kind of, I do that as like kind of like a therapy. I like walk around and take photos or like graffiti or like, um, you know, trains or like something like that. I see you're pretty big into skating again. Oh yeah. Skating. Yeah. And I got, and I got back into it and I've just been like, I don't know, just, it was kind of like what I said with the beats, like a gasket blue with that too. And I just can't stop. Like I just been skating a lot, like pretty hard. You what know? about you, Jerm? You, you skate a lot still? Yeah. I've been back at it really. Um, I think for a long time, once I was really in the studio a lot, it was like, I was, I was good at skating in like 2008. Yeah. And then once I was in the studio every day, it's like kind of lost it for a second, just dwindled. Um, And then I kind of was like, man, I'm like too old to do it. And then (laughs) I was like, that's such a stupid way to look at it. It's like, how old are you now? 35. Yeah. So I'm not like too old to do (laughs) to skate. And for a while it was like frustrating. Like I was relearning stuff and now I kind of enjoy that. So yeah, yeah, it's been good. And then being back here, like in Atlanta, I didn't have, I didn't find like a crew of people to skate with. And here it's like, you know, I've been skating with Bill and then uh, my boy Nick Panza and 
like I have different little crews of people I can skate with here and I know yeah. where all the spots are, all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. It's more, I mean, it's more welcoming here. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure, you know, you might see people you, you know, you run into. Yep. Um, okay. So the tape comes out Saturday. Uh, obviously, you know, it'd probably be everywhere. Everyone could find it everywhere. Yeah. We're like Spotify, Apple music. Okay. And, uh, now, I mean, I think we kind of got to everything we needed to get to as far as the tape. I mean, do you want to get to some of these questions that people submitted? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm interested. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah there's, a, there's actually a good bit of them. Oh, well. Uh, all right. So let me get to these right now. A lot of interesting ones. A lot of skating. <laughs> uh, nice. Okay. So uh, first question, what's the best skate park in Pittsburgh? I like boys. You like boys? Okay. Yeah, I, I would say boys now too. Jerome put me on to boys recently. Mm. Is there the, is there a lot of people that are out there still? Do people go there a lot anymore? I don't know because usually, <laughs> you know, I don't have like a normal work schedule. Yeah. So my favorite time to go out there is like 10 in the morning or something. Yeah. And there's usually not people. You see boys out there now handing you mixtapes at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just put it out there. Um. All right. Well, uh, will we ever get a skate for? I think so. I hope so. They announced Kind of announced it last year, but that doesn't mean anything. Announced it every year. I feel like. Whatever, get a what? Skate four. Like EA. The game. Uh, Were you a fan of skate? Uh no, I I just played Tony Hawk. Yeah, like I I never was like big into. Don't even know what skate is. Skate is a sick game for sure. You have a lot of control over it. It's definitely hard. When did the first one come out? (sighs) Like two thousand and maybe thirteen or something. I never. Nah, I want to say the first one probably oh seven oh eight. Uh, which one? Well, then two was like. One of them came out around then. That's the only one I played, but uh, my boy was real good at it. You were able to make like whole skate videos, like like put it to music and shit like that. Maddie really? actually, mm. Maddie made the illest skate video I've ever seen <laughs> on skate, and it was to going back to Cali, and uh, he had all the fucking drops whenever the fucking <laughs> wheels were hitting, and uh, you know he always was good at all that shit before. Um, best sandwich in Pittsburgh. Peppy's baby, come on now. I've never been there. My Peppy. boy lives across the street. I've never been there. He was like, You ain't never been here before. It's a sin. And uh, I, I guess I got to go. Best sandwich in Pittsburgh. South Philly at Peppy's baby. Mm, damn. I'm not, I, haven't, I haven't been around long enough. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I'll bombard you with the other questions. Germs and pizza and wing guy. That's yeah. all that was. But Northumberland Market, too. Shout out your Buffalo Chicken Crunchy Sandwich. <laughs> Buffalo Chicken Crunchy Sandwich sounds good. Uh, guilty Pleasure album. Guilty Pleasure album? Yeah, like, like I assume people were like, you know, man, I fucking love Human Clay by Creed or some shit like that. It's a, it's a guilty pleasure. Like, what what do you got? I don't know. There's a lot of goofy questions, and you guys yeah. don't get to leave until you answer I don't them. think, I think. I have to really think about that. <laughs> That's all right. I'll cut out any downtime. <laughs> I'll, I'll check my Spotify. All right, a Guilty Pleasure album. Yeah. Oh, uh, I mean... I like I write uh, Ray uh, Lamontagne. I don't I don't knock him for not his his uh, I like Ray Lamontagne. His album uh, called Trouble uh, Ray Lamontagne or whatever. I don't know who. It's kind of like depressing, sad music. Like, All right, I listen to that sometimes. Mm, I'm looking at my liked songs on Spotify. <laughs> I'm telling you, All Star Smash really like. Mouth. <laughs> um. I guess I did listen to um, Pearl Jam the other day. <laughs> All right, that's fine. That's a good. That's a good answer. Um, okay, uh, someone said, "Whatever happened to the locals only brand?" Locals only. Uh, that was just something short lived. Me and my boy did. Uh, uh, we pro- I think we did like one uh, collection and did like a couple of things after that. But we just kind of dr- ended up dropping it after that. All right. Uh, favorite skate deck of all time. I thought this was a good like question. brand or just a favorite graphic. So I I, I want to know both. So I want to know your favorite graphic because your favorite graphic might necessarily be your favorite brand. Um, there's this girl, you know, girl skateboards. Yeah, Sean Sheffy deck. I actually have one. For, it's from like 1996, but um, it's a Muhammad Ali. Really, Sean Sheffy board. I'll see if I can find a picture of it. But yeah, um, it's probably my favorite graphic. My favorite graphic was the um, the Jeremy Klein uh, hookups uh, Alice in Wonderland uh, mm. deck. I know exactly what that one is. Oh wow, I never seen that. 
You said it's from the it's, uh, 90s. It's rare, yeah. Oh, wow. I started skating in 97, so I like anything like... Around then. Anything like 95 to 99, like late 90s, like mid and late 90s. It's like my favorite era of skateboarding. That's sick. And you found one of them? Yeah. Where'd you find it? eBay. Uh, how much? Um, I forget. I probably paid like 300, but I saw one on there uh, like a few months ago for like 1500. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, that's dope. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, favorite skate shoe? Uh, Vans Half Cab. Mm. Easily. You I know, know I always see you wearing that. Only shoe I skate in now. My favorite, my favorite skate shoes back in the day were like my Osiris's and stuff Which like ones, that. Which ones, like the D3s? Yeah, like yeah. I swear I had a pair of D3s at least once. Uh, and uh, I, like, I was never allowed to buy them whenever I was younger because they were a little bit too expensive. But you already knew whenever I got the big boy job, I got two pair in the closet. <laughs> yeah. I never wear them now because they're just obnoxious, but I got them up there. It's yeah, nice it was like hard, it was hard getting my mom. Um, she would, yeah, but yeah, the D threes and uh, but I have I don't wear them now. I wear Vans now, but I I, I, want, I was just thinking like I want to go back and buy my first pair of like uh, D threes and or trying to skate in them. You if know you mean? felt what they feel like now, like they're they're sick. Are like, they on point? No, I mean like I mean they're comfy, but they're just way too big. Like oh really? Obnoxious <laughs> big. Um, okay, uh, favorite local musical artist in the city. Ooh. Oh, I know it's powerful. That's a powerful answer. Favorite for local musical yeah. artist. Ooh. Um, I don't want to offend anybody either. You don't have to offend <laughs> anyone. No one's going to be offended. Well, I would just pick. People are going to come man. to the skate park at 10 a.m. after you. Well, I'm not going to pick. Do they Bill have to be he, alive? He's right here. You don't have to be alive. Wapo. Okay. Jimmy Wapo, without a doubt. All right. I was such a big fan. I am such a big fan. Um. Present company excluded. I'm just, I'm gonna say Vinny Radio. Mm. Mm. So that's a that's mm. an understandable answer for sure. That's a real good answer. Uh, I've been listening to Reese Young in a lot. Like hit, yo, I, my boy just crazy. my boy uh, just put me on to him, uh, or, or just told me about how he signed a Birdman, and like and then I like start watching all his videos. I was like, oh wow. Whenever I worked at Threads, like he was always in there copping shit, and like that was like before he started like getting to where he is now, and before he like kind of found his voice. And uh, I saw a video the other day that was like it was shared by someone, it got millions of views, and it's just like him. I thought it was someone else, and I put it on. I was like, I can't believe that like. It's just where it is now. It don't even sound the same, but uh, that's no, probably... I mean, I'm happy for him. Yeah, like, I mean, like, he was sick back then. He was always super nice back then, and, like, it's bro. cool to see people doing well. Yeah, like, anybody bro. from Pittsburgh, I want to see him succeed. You yeah, know what I mean? for yeah. sure. Absolutely. Reese Young is thorough, too. I know, I know people he used to run. He's thorough. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, favorite physical artist in the city. So, like, I guess people that are making paintings, graffiti, whatever. Connor Clark. Connor Clark. For me. I don't know who that is. He's a, a material artist. Okay. Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good answer too. I'm sorry. Uh, what is something you like to tell yourself while you're creating music? Mm, that I don't suck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm the best. In, I don't know. fucking suck. Yeah. You ever see Donnie Darko? Yeah. Because I'm not afraid anymore. <laughs> I do. I do little affirmations like that to myself all the time. I mean, that's, I mean, I, I'm getting into, uh, I get into like more in my later years, I've been getting into like more wild shit like that. Like whether it's like affirmations, whether it's like meditation, shit like that, sensory deprivation. It's like, I'm really just out there trying whatever. I got my buddy, uh, yoga Ralph who's on here. He's this dude from a key sport grew up with like Mayo and B white and everything. This dude just grew up, used to just sell weed, listening like bone thugs and shit. Now he's like this yoga practitioner, lost like a hundred pounds. He's just out there. Like he's getting me to go to like gong yoga and shit. Like we were talking about wild shit at that 58th thing yesterday. He, uh, it's just wild to hear about like, cause you, you know, whenever you're younger, you're hanging around people and you're, you you gravitate towards what they do and like everything, you know, if they're doing it, it's acceptable. Back then, if you were like starting to do yoga and you had no friends that do it, you know, boys were clowning you crazy, but, uh, it's wild. It's wild for all the things that, uh, we gravitate towards in our later of our life. Yeah. Uh, what is the longest you've searched for a sample? Mm. I feel like it's a loaded question. It's like, is there any, you ever have any, like, uh, like, uh, yeah, I didn't really understand that because I feel like, you know, as soon as, as soon as I read that question, I saw like, uh, I watched this documentary about T-Pain, um, about like the auto tune shit. Mm-hmm. Did you see that on Netflix? Like what Usher said to him? Well, well what he did there, but T-Pain said that like he heard a commercial 
and the girl's voice had some sort of like, you know, effect on it. And he said he spent like a year of just like buying every single <laughs> software, looking in all the plugins and everything until he finally found it out. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I don't know if they're saying like, yeah, looking for somebody either. else, like something somebody else, like if Kanye sampled something, if uh, I was looking for it, or if they're saying like, if I was looking for a particular kind of sound. Yeah. That would be more like experimentation, which you said, like finding the sample, like the dude found the sample real quick. Yeah. You know? I feel like with Jeremy, it's more intuitive. He just picks, he just picks stuff up. Like if people, I feel like that question might come from maybe somebody overthinking it. Like, I feel like whenever I talked to you beforehand, uh, the first time I saw it, I saw that big record wall that you had mm-hmm. there. And uh, I remember asking you like where you get a lot of your samples from. You said that you just like listen to a bunch of like wild old ass shit and you just like cut it from there. Yeah. And most of that shit, like basically if you're like digging for records, you're not going to find exactly what you're, what yeah. exa- exactly what you want. You're, you're just going to have to, yeah, you're going to see what you find and like, hopefully you stumble upon something. So it's for me, it's more just like, just being patient and not too particular and like yeah. trying to get creative with what you have. Do you be listening to like old ass shit and like you just hear sounds or parts that you like and then you'll just like cut it right there and keep them all in a folder that you, that, like you might not necessarily have a, might not necessarily have a beat for it right then and there, but oh, you yeah. know that you'll use it. I have a whole Pro Tools session where it's just samples. Like, I mean, I do it all the time. Like every few months I'll just make a new, a new session and it's like a bunch of different like I'll sample the whole song, even if it's just like one piece I want just yeah. in case, like just for the future. But um, yeah, I'll just record in a bunch of songs and then maybe I'll like put a marker of like, I like this part for me to remember next time. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I'll have like specific days where it's like more looking for samples and recording them and stuff. And then, so then when I do want to make beats, it's like, I have something right there. I'm not like looking for, you know, whatever record right then. It's like, I try to just get it down. And even like, I mean, I have a, my Spotify, I have like a sample playlist on here. So it's like, if I hear something on Spotify, I'll put it in there. That's what the one question is, is like, uh, like, like how do you listen to music and like cut in samples? Like, are you like, do you actively like listen to just wild shit? You might not necessarily like listen to all the time just for, yeah, just for the sole purpose of trying to find samples. Yeah. There's like prog rock, Records. Prog rock. Yeah, like different there just might be one cool part on a on a record and it's like those kind of like the prog rock, the there's so many changes in those songs. So it might be like the beginning of the song, I'm like, this shit's crazy. Like I can never mm. sample this and then it, it hits one little part and then it'll go back. So you just like over that time, you know, over the years of you trying to like build that arsenal of all these songs, like you're probably just listening to all kinds of different shit. Mm-hmm. Like just you probably find a lot of cool shit and for there's, it. And there's different, um, like, blogs now. Like, people upload stuff. Like, mm. they'll, they'll rip, like, records or something. So it's like a combination of me buying records, um, Spotify, even, like, YouTube sometimes, even though it sounds like shit. Yeah. I'll, like, I'll sample off YouTube. It just depends, like. Do you ever, uh, do you ever play any instruments? Um, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, a little, like, I can play enough, like, you know, with MIDI on, on the computer. Like, I can play, like, whatever note, but I, I can't like, you're not going to just get on a guitar real quick and start. Hell no. I mean, that's partially why all this shit is so weird because I was like listening to music, but I was never like, Oh, I can do that. Like I can make music myself. So yeah, basically anybody, if they like want it enough, you can do it. You know what I mean? Like if I can do it, you can do it. I'm I'm, I'm cutting that as a sample and it's just going to be on there. It's funny because I always saw like, I could never produce, but I could rap. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, I feel like, yeah, it's a whole ball of wax. Okay, uh, favorite <laughs> Mac joints from the Bothians. Ah, uh, that's a good one. I um, still, I just like Ascension because just I remember making it with them, and then I, you know, just the whole process, and I don't know. It was kind of one of the last things we did, I guess. Yeah. So, sorry not to make it sad. No, 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 no. My favorite thing he ever did was the Spotify singles. I think. Mm. That was my favorite music here. That was my favorite thing. Is that like the the buttons? Uh, yeah, and then like Dunno, like one of them. Yeah, or, okay. no, no, one was them. Like one of them's like a cover. I found that out later. Like I never really. Um, but yeah. Okay, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and the favorite places you've ever traveled. Um, I ain't traveled much. Me either. Um, I like New York and Miami. Cause my fiance's from Miami, so I'm there a lot. 
Mm. Costa Rica. I went to Costa Rica once. That's what's up. Uh, all right. So those were just the, the you know, those were the freebie questions from people. But uh, now I'm going to throw you all to the wolves. And uh, we're going to do the ending segment called Desert Island Questions. <laughs> uh, look at this, Jeremy. Official. I know, See how nice. official this is? I'm, uh, I'm out here working. I got samples of uh, Mike Tyson on there and shit like that. I do that. what I hate to do, but I do it like I, I mean. Uh. Uh, but uh, okay, so the Desert Island Questions is a segment that I do with all guests where I give them three categories to take with them on a desert island to use until they starve to death and die. Uh, first category, three things to watch. So uh, you guys get to, you know, in a perfect world, you're, you're on a desert island like Tom Hanks. You have a TV with an integrated DVD player and you get three DVDs, single DVDs. Um, you got to pick them. Uh, I get Finding Forrester. Oh, that's a good one, man! It's been a long time since I watched that. Um, the High Mark, uh, the Piano Lesson, um, August Wilson, um, DVD. I have that. Um, it's like a, it's like a, a High Mark picture film of one of August Wilson's plays called The Piano Lesson. Oh, wow. and I have the, I just have the DVD and I watch it all the time. And then Fresh. Okay. Um, maybe like. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. And then uh, I like Lord of the Rings too. Mm-hmm. And wow. then I'd say uh, Mouse. It's a it's a skate video yeah. by a girl skateboards. Well, uh, perfect segue is uh, instead of uh, three books, like I usually ask people three books to read. You can answer that, but I'm more curious about uh, three skate videos that you, that you all like. Um, do you like books? Do you want books or skate videos? We could do both. Give me both of you one. I got all the time in the world. You go first. What are your favorite skate videos? Yeah, Girl Mouse. Okay. I don't know if I'm allowed to. You can take that it. one. I'll allow it. And then uh, Trilogy. It's a. Uh, it was like World Industries. So like, and this is back when they had like 101 skateboards. This is from like '96 too. Um, it was like 101 blind skateboards. Yeah. And um, in World, and then uh, Eastern Exposure, um the third one so it's just like it's all philly all right philly video um the two the two skate videos i remember like real vividly is zero misled use yeah and then um the shorties fulfill the dream oh that was a good one um god there was another birdhouse one um that i couldn't remember but i just remember being like pretty explicit and like i'd always seen like tony hawk in like a positive light and i remember it was like kind of yeah. ex- more, a little more explicit and like the i think end. the end or something like it was like a birdhouse one around the year 2000 or 2001 or something the end was i think was like 98 so maybe we're thinking of something different i, I think it might have been the one like just after that or like the new one around like 2001 but i just remember seeing like i think it was like tony hawk like smashed a beer bottle on the ground or something like that and i was like that's crazy i've never seen him do anything like flicks that. off a camera and throws a beer bottle yeah it's the craziest dude ever i forgot um okay what about books he said books uh did you have books at all I just read, I read like audio engineering books. Yeah. Don't even, I don't even want to know about your audio engineering books. I'll just get it. It's pretty, it's not real exciting. My stuff's pretty like, I don't know. Like I, I, my biggest thing, like one thing that's usually influenced me is I picked up all 10 August Wilson plays and read them as books. They're all published. So they're all books. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, I don't know, man, besides that, uh, like two books that changed my life forever are a couple books, uh, Napoleon Hill, he wrote uh, several books, but two of them is uh, Think and Grow Rich and Outwitting the Devil. And um, those books absolutely changed my life. They're, I will credit them with everything. Outwitting the Devil. Yeah, it's called, one's called Outwitting the Devil and one's called Think and Grow Rich. And uh, what's it called? And um, yeah, so those are my. And, yeah. Yeah. Those are good. Yeah. Those are good. I would like give you all the August Wilson plays. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> third category, uh, probably. <laughs> uh, three. Okay, so the probably the hardest question is uh, three CDs. You guys get to pick three CDs to take with you. That's probably the hardest for you, huh? No. You had actually. I think you had pretty quick uh, answers last time, and they were uh, nothing that I expected. I mean, now I don't know if it even would have changed in three years, but I love Supreme, John Coltrane. That's one that you picked. Marvin Gaye. Um, What's going on? I think that's another one you picked. And then probably like college dropout or something like that. Just because, or blueprint. 
something like Rockefeller from then, like that era, like those couple years, like 2000, 2000 to, you know, well, 2001 to 2004. Yeah. Anything Rockefeller, basically. All right. Did you guys see, uh, <laughs> this is a very side uh, sidetrack, but uh, I just saw it on Facebook. It was Juvenile and Manny oh, yeah. singing Vax That Ass. Or <laughs> Vax, That's it, right, yeah. Someone stopped was me. Was it called Vax That, that Ass? I, I was like, I can't believe I'm watching this. <laughs> I thought it was a video that someone dubbed it over, and I was like, this is wild that this is real. Uh, but all right, three CDs from you. Um, I would probably pick... Uh, Dr. Dre, Chronic 2001. Mm-hmm. Not the first one. I honestly don't care about the first one. But I love the first one. Really? <laughs> um, I know, isn't that funny? It's funny how it works. I'm just being honest. I'm, That's fine. That's but, what uh, I want. Yeah. All right. So Chron- Dr. Dre, Chronic 2001. Uh, and I thought it was so funny. Like the first time I heard Vince be like, man, I don't give a fuck about the old rappers. I started listening to Bow Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and I, But I anyway, it just reminded me of that. But all right. So Chronic 2001. I'd say DMX, The Great Depression. Mm. Um and then, uh, man, I don't know. I want to pick like something else. I'm stuck right now. Slim right. Shady LP. Slim Whatever. Shady LP. Yeah, I, I just, I just decided to do all hip hop instead of like go outside the box. That's fine. It's not live, you know, I'll cut it out anyway, but, uh, okay. uh, okay. So the third to last question is the death row meal. I could just like say, wait, I fucked it up. <laughs> there it is. The death row meal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the death row meal is whenever, you know, you ever see them articles about people on death row, they give them their last meal, whatever they want. So uh, you got to give me at least one appetizer, one main dish, and one dessert. One appetizer, one main Anywhere dish, you want in the dessert. world or from anyone, doesn't matter. Do you go on first? You know? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, appetizer would be like wing dust wings. <laughs> Wing dust wings. <laughs> Who do you think got the best wings in the city? I don't know. M- me. W- you, you you nice with them? Yeah. Jeremy is nice. I just gripped myself a grill yesterday. What'd you get? I got a Traeger. Oh, me too. I got one like two weeks ago. What'd you get? The 575. I don't know what that one is. I uh, I got a... Uh, I got I got one. It's like the Ironwood. Mm. It's a big ass one, but uh, I'm about to fire it up after this and try to get a gun. I didn't know you were into you were into the old grill. Oh yeah, yeah. You I used to have done. a smoker and a grill at the studio. I just got that trigger the other day. Um, yeah, leveling up in life. Yeah. Uh, okay, so some wing dust wings. Um, this is gonna piss you off, but probably Fiori's. Uh. <laughs> Fiori's. Are you not a Fiori's fan? I just think it's the most overrated pizza in the world. <laughs> you know, like everyone's like, dude, it's the best. I would, there's a million places that are, I don't know. Don't even get me started with it. Right. I'm just, a, it's a loaded question. So Fiori's pepperoni. You think if you think if I put a Fiori's pizza down, you didn't know it was Fiori's and I bought four other pieces or three other pieces, you'd be able to tell the difference? Yeah. Three other I, shitty I, pizzas. I honestly think I would. I would think I would too. Maybe I just had bad experiences every time I went there. Uh, it's just wet. You know, you pull it up and cheese is just falling off and shit. I don't know. Sorry about it. Uh, Depends on who makes it too. God forbid. I'm going to get crucified because Fiori's is like a national treasure in the nah, city. It's your opinion. It's fine. Yeah. fault. I am. That's fine, man. And then these are very basic answers just because it'd be like, you know, I'd say like an Eminem blizzard mm. <laughs> for dessert. That's a good answer. <laughs> All right. Pasta salad from Beer's Pub. The pesto pasta salad from Beer's Pub. That's the appetizer. All okay. right. All right. And then for the entree, uh, we're going to do um, green curry mm. and fried chicken at uh, Noodle Head. Oh, Noodle Head is crazy. And then for dessert, we're going to do the ter- homemade tiramisu at uh, my boy Frankie's spot, Cucina Vitale. Wow. That's a good choice. Tiramisu. Uh, that's a good I, choice. I killed that, Loki. Yeah, that was good. Okay, uh, second to last question, which is probably the most uh, revealing question. If you're getting ready to go on a road trip, you go into a gas station, get to pick one snack, what would it be? Trail mix. Trail mix. 
Trail me. I'm, what I'm, kind? Like a fruit and nut, or just like the chocolate? And to be my favorite like snack. It's not from a gas station, but it's trail mix from Trader Joe's. It's like. Uh, it's just cashews, almonds, and dark chocolate pieces. That's yeah, all it is. I knew exactly what you're, the chocolate trunk ones. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. fire. I, I'd crush those all day. Yeah, that's good. It's a good choice. Mine would be fruit snacks of some sort. So maybe like, even like the Welch's, just like the regular ass Welch's. Yeah. Or the tropical. Yeah. Fruit snacks. Those are good. Uh, the best ones, that probably the Scooby-Doo, uh, the ones that are opaque. Yeah. Not translucent. <laughs> Got to be real specific. All right. Uh, last question uh, that I ask everyone is if anyone could have a conversation with anyone alive or dead, who would it be and why? If you pick a loved one, I got to ask someone else. It can't be a loved one. Yeah. Conversation with anyone? Yeah. Anyone alive or dead. It could be fake people. I've had people say Randy Marsh on here. <laughs> I'd say like Just Blaze or mm. Kanye. Yeah. Even though Kanye, I'm not totally sure nowadays. Do you think you would enjoy the conversation with him? I don't think so. I don't think so either. It's more like, it would be basically just like production. Yeah, I get it. That's all it would be. Wait, you said, um, I thought they had to be dead. Alive or dead. Oh, alive or dead? Could be anyone. Wait, all right, say that question one more time. Have a conversation with anyone alive or dead. Who would it be and why? And if I say that person, he said, yeah, anyone, even a fake, I'm talking about like the situation is you're just like, you know, in a fucking waiting room and you guys are just talking for two hours. Just that's it. Like Uh, my answer would be like probably Robin Williams or like Richard Pryor or something like that. Oh my gosh. I have such a dorky, I have such dorky answers that come to the top of my head. You're about to be episode like 171. I've literally heard every answer almost. Just the conversation. Um, I don't know. I want to have a conversation with uh, a lot of, uh, I can't pronounce his name. Can I look up his name real quick? Look it up. I just didn't know how to pronounce it. That's fine. I want to have a, a conversation with Babak uh, Tafreshi. He's a uh, photographer for National Geographic, and he does uh, he does like night tours and takes people out to watch like the Northern Lights and stuff. Wow! And just you know, he's a photographer enough for National Geographic. I just like that would be super dope. You gotta like, I don't know. You gotta to be a photographer for National Geographic. I feel like you gotta be you gotta know your stuff for sure. You have to go through a lot of stuff. So I bet you he has a lot of stories. You for know? sure, that would be a, that's a that's a super dope answer. Someone uh, a couple of weeks ago, he uh, he uh, <clears throat> chose a Neanderthal. Like he he wanted to talk to a caveman. Really, uh, and I was like, damn, that's such a good answer because like if you could, you know, I, I it's a if you could make that happen, it would be fucking sick to you know hear about that type of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. All right. I appreciate you guys coming over to talk to me. Thanks I know so it was, much. I know it was a uh, you know it's a convoluted conversation with two people. I usually only talk to one people or yeah. one person at a time. But uh, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm, I'm I'm already happy to hear what I heard. But uh, I'm excited for you two to be able to put this out. Thanks, man. Um, I appreciate you both taking the time to come over and talk to me. Take a second and tell people where they could follow you and uh, where they could find the album. Um. Well, you can follow me on Instagram at Bill Ways um, and Big Germs, Big Germ Four One Two for Instagram. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, we got a video that we just did for Big Ways. So we're gonna make our first uh, Big Ways YouTube channel. Mm. We're gonna do that. Boyd did the video. Justin oh, Boyd. Shout out to Boyd. <laughs> what a guy. He's out there searching for that three hundred point bowling game. He got a two ninety last week. He, he I know. It. I saw. I'm it. sure he sent it to you. He's sick. <laughs> you know, he's sick in the head for that. First time I talked to Boyd, he was like, I used to bowl a lot whenever I was younger. I was on like the bowling team and I was like, you don't know nothing about bowling. And he just fucking said these crazy ass scores. His yeah. name wasn't on there though. So I don't know if I believe him. Yeah, it's fake. <laughs> yeah, but the album will be uploaded everywhere on the 17th. Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, everything, big waves. When's the video drop? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we just got it back. So um, um, we'll, we'll, fi- we'll figure that out soon. Follow here. the Instagrams. You'll yeah, be able to yeah, figure definitely, it out. Definitely. Uh, everyone else that's listening, appreciate it as usual. Uh, follow uh, at Bill Waves, Big Germ 412. I'll call you right back. And uh, I'll see you next week. Have a good day. I'll call you right back. Please.